All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoyed lunch. And welcome back for the afternoon session. I'm going to be talking about OAuth and OpenID Connect. So um, we have three hours. Um, I have a timer in front. It says 180 minutes. Uh, that doesn't happen too often <laughs> for conference talks or conference presentations. So we're going to have a pretty interesting journey into the landscape, into the world of OAuth and OIDC. So uh, sit back, relax, which is also not something that happens that often at conferences. Uh, so enjoy the environment, um, sit back and relax. I'm going to take you on a hopefully wonderful journey into OAuth and OIDC. All right. So what are we going to talk about? OAuth. OAuth is, well, it's, it's confusing. <laughs> That's certainly one thing. It's called the authorization framework. Um, I'm not really sure that was the best description of what OAuth is, but what really matters is here that OAuth 2.0 is from 2012. That is a long, long time ago. That is 11 years uh, to date, so that's definitely not something recent. And as a consequence, things have evolved. And we've had some additions, we had retractions, we had um, changes, modified behavior, and so on and so on. And what we basically have today is a whole bunch of specifications. We have OIDC on top of OAuT, and in general, it is a massive, uh, massively complicated topic, which is essentially why I'm here. And if you're looking like this right now, obligatory cat picture <laughs> for the presentation, if you're looking like this, you're definitely not alone. I've been doing OAuth and OIDC work for a long time now, um, multiple years, and I've seen how much developers struggle with it. I've seen developers face choices that they don't really have an idea of how to make them and so on and so on. And I'm not alone in that. And there, there's some effort going on to build an OAuth 2.1, um, which is basically not a new mechanism. It's the old one, but kind of all the best practices rolled into one specification. So instead of having to read like a dozen specs or more, you can read one spec and be up to date. So that's already a big improvement, but OAuth 2.1 is not there yet. It's going to take a while um, because there's some dependencies that need to be fleshed out first before we get there. But in this presentation, I'm going to be talking about OAuth or OAuth 2.0 or 2.x or whatever. And in, in essence, that kind of means the best practices for OAuth 2.0, which will eventually become 2.1, and which is essentially the current version of OAuth. If you want to look further down the line, I don't have slides on that because it's future music, but they're working on like a successor of OAuth, which will not be OAuth 3.0, but probably something called GNAP, uh, the Grant Negotiation and Authorization Protocol, which is kind of a very much more advanced version of OAuth um, from lessons learned and so on, but that is definitely future music that's being actively developed, so that's a couple of years out before we talk about that. So instead of looking to the future and looking at great things that will come down the line first, um, let's do what I ma mainly focus on, and that's helping you understand what the best practices are for building OAuth applications today. And to do that, I'm going to use a whole bunch of slides, a whole bunch of pictures. Uh, I'll use some examples, uh, some demos, uh, as well, so you get to see something in action. Somewhere down the line, we'll have a break as well, because three hours is not a good idea to keep talking in one straight piece. And hopefully by the end, you'll walk away with a solid understanding of what these things are, what you're supposed to do, and where you can look for further knowledge on this topic. What is OAuth really about? And how does OIDC come into play? And I should be Careful here. Usually, I'm used to walking around, but I, I guess the cameraman is not going to like that very much if I'll be walking around. So I'll, I'll try to stay in this area uh, while moving a bit. But what is OAuth and OIDC really about? Well, it's about clients, client applications trying to do something. And a client can be any kind of application. It can be a back-end web app, can be a front-end web app, a mobile app, even just some piece of software running somewhere without really being a specific type of client. But clients are trying to do something and they rely on a central service to do that. And I've rephrased this slide in like human understandable questions. And one of the questions that a client can ask is like, hey, can you authenticate this user for me? I have a user here and I want to know who they are. Can you make that happen for me? That would be OpenID Connect. And a second question is like, hey, I would like to access something probably on behalf of the user or directly, like an API, can you make that happen? Can you give me something I can present to the API so that the API knows who I am and can make an authorization decision? And that part is OAuth. And how these things relate to each other will become clear in short, uh, shortly. Of course, if you try to access something, it's there's some resource that you want to access. And in general, um, use cases today, that's going to be an API. 
we're building API-based applications, I would say the majority of use cases for OAuth will be an API. You can have other types of resources that might be accessed, but in general, we're talking about APIs these days. So the client is asking the API like, hey, I wanna do something, can you make that happen? And the authorization part or the relaying information there, that's gonna be an OAuth uh, aspect. And then the API, if you're an API, you get a call, you're like, how, do, how the hell do I know if this is uh, allowed or not? So there's gonna be some dependency on that central service to figure out if this is allowed, yes or no. And that can be very explicit, like a request and a response, or very implicit, like validating some data and making sure it's valid. We'll talk about all of that later on. All right, this triangle is important. That's the landscape of what we're gonna talk about. The majority of the complexity is in, let me highlight this, where's my screen here, is in this connection. It's a single arrow here. When we get to the meaty part of the presentation, um, it's gonna be like 13 steps or something to get that done. So it's, it's slightly complicated, but once you get it, it makes sense, hopefully, and <laughs> you can move forward from that. If you've been dealing with OAuth or OIDC, you may be a bit skeptical about the terms I'm using here. Like a security token service, you won't find that word in the specification somewhere but you'll find authorization servers when you read OAuth documents or identity providers when you read OIDC documents. And this kind of means that I would have to switch between two terms throughout the presentation depending on what we're talking about and it gets really confusing if you're talking about things at the same time because then what term do you use? So what I do in, in this session and in all my training courses basically is I try to settle on a single set of terminology, some simplifications to make things understandable and if you wanna read the documents or translate this back to what you read in the RFCs, uh, this slide can help you. So for OAuth, we talk about resource owners, which is like a very generic concept, but in, in general, in most applications we build, that's gonna be a user. And we talk about resource servers, which is, like I said, APIs in most of the use cases we have today. And then we have the authorization server, which is that security token service. And then we have client applications, which is the client trying to do something. And that's what I'm gonna use throughout this presentation. Before we dive in, a small word about myself. I'm Philippe de Rijk, I'm from Belgium, so this is kind of a, a home presentation for me, which is uh, nice for once. And I basically help developers and architects, software professionals understand security. That's what I do. I have a PhD in web security and I've been doing security for forever, basically. And what I try to help teams is understand security make decisions, make trade-offs, um, implement best practices, and so on. And I do that through security training, conference talks, online courses, and very specific consulting on advanced topics like OAuth, OIDC, and so on. I'm a Google developer expert and an Altzera ambassador. These are several outreach programs um, where they reward people contributing to the community with conference talks and sessions like this. So uh, that's definitely an honor to be part of those programs. And I also organize SecOpDev, which is a Belgian security course where we invite people from all over the world uh, to Leuven in Belgium to speak about security. It's a one week course and if you're interested in that, it runs in June next year, so check it out if you want to. For this presentation, I have some slides. Um, you can grab a copy from my website, so I'm very easy to find. Um, if you Google me, you'll find that, you'll find the slides and so on and so on. You can download the PDF later or you can grab it right now if you want to or find the link on LinkedIn or Mastodon as well. So that's an easy way to get a hold of those slides. All right, let's dive in. Let's talk about use cases, let's talk about flows, and let's talk about doing something with OAuth and with OpenID Connect. So let me go back to this triangle um, where we have OAuth and OpenID Connect, whether it's OAuth 2.0, 2.1, whatever, 2.x, uh, that's the easy way to describe that. And I wanna focus, I wanna start with OpenID Connect. Because OpenID Connect is the easy part. Well, the, the interaction with that security token service is complicated, but the concept of what you're trying to do only involves, to, involves two parties. We're trying to authenticate a user. What does that look like? Well, if you're building an application today, if you're starting from scratch, I would say you don't implement authentication anymore. You don't wanna deal with usernames and passwords and password reset features or passwordless or pass keys and web authentication. It's an absolute freaking nightmare. And if you involve multi-factor authentication, that's a lot of developer effort. So if you wanna build an application today, my recommendation is gonna be let's use an identity provider. Let's use that security token service. And your, your application just asks a service like, yeah, you tell me who the user is, 
you handle authentication and I'm, I can focus on what I do best and that's building the application. That is one use case where we offload authentication to a central provider. And that can be very commonly um, scenarios involve um, Azure Active Directory. You just offload authentication to Azure, they handle everything, they handle multi-factor out, and your app just gets information like, hey, this user is Philip, and his ID is something, something, and whatever else you need to know or want to know about that user. Done. Your application, basically zero lines of authentication code, and that is a very nice way moving forward. That's one use case. Other use cases involve social login. If you want to implement sign-in with Google, you're going to be using OpenID Connect to make that happen, to talk to Google, and Google is going to come back to your apps and say, like, oh yeah, we know this user as Philip, and their Google ID is 17, and so on and so on. And that's essentially how that works. I know it says connect with Facebook on the slide here. Um, that's a complicated story because Facebook does not do OpenID Connect, but the concept is, they call it Facebook Connect, so I'll, I'll leave it in the middle. It's a <laughs> you make up your mind about that. And then the third use case that's very, very common in the enterprise world is doing SaaS authentication. So basically, if you're, um, if you're building software, if you're building a SaaS, uh, if you have enterprise customers, they're going to come to you and say like, yeah, we don't want to make users on your platform. We just want you to call us and we'll handle authentication of our users and you make sure that works. And that used to be SAML back in the day and today uh, you'll implement that with OpenID Connect or SAML if you're very unlucky and fortunate and you have to implement that as well. But you can bridge SAML and OIDC together and so on and so on. But that's essentially what OpenID Connect does in practice. All right, I promised you some demos. Let me show you um, briefly what this looks like just so we have an idea um, of what's going on and then we can refer back to these examples later on. All right, live demo, so um, things are gonna go wrong and I'll deal with that as we move forward. All right, what I have here is I have a very crappy demo. So my demos really suck, by the way, so my apologies for that. I have a very crappy demo where we have a backend node application where we're going to use uh, OpenID Connect to authenticate. So if we look at the demo right here, like I said, it, it's crap, but uh, <laughs> bear with me, please. Uh, we're not logged in. This is anonymous now. We can click the login link. It's not even a button. It's just a link. We can click the login link, and that will uh, run an OIDC flow where we have to authenticate. And that's the offloading of authentication. So if we click this, we'll be taken to our identity, well, we were, or sorry, about, sorry about that. If you click this, we'll be taken to our identity provider where we are asked to log in. I'm using Alt0 here as an example, by the way, because I am an Alt0 ambassador and it kind of makes sense and it's easy to show. Uh, you can do this with any implementation. You can do this with Keycloak, used very often with Azure Active Directory. You can run your own software like Identity Server or whatever you prefer doing, as long as you have an OIDC implementation, you can run a flow like this. And this basically handles authentication at the IDP level, so I can log in with my username and password. And when we do that, we're sent back to the application, which now says like, hey, hi, Philippe Direk, and so on and so on. So that's OpenID Connect. That's how we integrate that into an application. What happens in the backend, I'll show you that later in the presentation when we talk about the details. So that's OIDC in practice. All right. Use case number one. By the way, I have a lot of slides with a massive amount of text on that. So if you ever followed like a PowerPoint course, step number one or lesson one is like, you only put seven words on a slide and otherwise it's crap and go home. The reason I do that is because I shared you a link to the slides and if I have a slide deck with all pretty pictures, that's gonna be very nice for you to look at here in the room and then next week when you revisit, revisit the slides, it's gonna be like, yeah, I have no idea what he said. So maybe you can find a recording somewhere and if you scroll through like three hours of video to find that exact thing I said. So yes, I have a lot of slides with text. I skip over most of the text in the, uh, in the talk itself, but you can refer back to that later on uh, when you download the PDF. So use case number one, only using OIDC. There's no OAuth involved, it's just an application asking who is the user, get some information about the user and handles the authentication with that information. That's it. Very simple, very straightforward, and actually the de facto way to implement authentication in new applications today. You really shouldn't be implementing usernames, passwords, reset, and so on. You should rely on that central service to do that. All right, use case number two, only using OAuth. When, you all, when, you're, when you're only using OAuth, we don't really care who the user is because we already know who the user is to us. 
And a scenario like that would, uh, for example, and let me go back to the triangle here, that's the full picture that we talked about in the beginning, OAuth, um, would be this part of the triangle, which is most of it. But it's a client. Let's imagine you're logged into a client application, and you want to connect that client to a second backend application. That's what you can do with OAuth. And one example I often use is Buffer, a social media scheduling tool. So I very often schedule social media posts up front because I don't want to be doing that live in the moment. And I have connected Buffer, which is its own application where I log in as my Buffer, my Buffer user and so on. I've connected that to my LinkedIn account and to my Mastodon account. And that's basically how the application uses OAuth, gets necessary tokens so they can talk to LinkedIn whenever something needs to be posted and get that post out. That's one example of how to do that. I'm going to use a second example here in the demo. And I'm, in my training applications, I use food-based applications. I use Restograde with restaurant reviews because I like good food and great restaurants, so that's a nice win. And I use a second application called Virtual Foodie, which offers services to foodies and whatever. And we're going to integrate these two in a scenario where you can basically um, use OAuth to talk to each other. So let me show you how that works. All right. I have to start a couple of things here. So we have one API, well, one application running. That's the virtual foodie application. And we have one API running, and that's the Restograde API. So two separate applications. Imagine these are two different parties when you run this in an online scenario. All right. So if you go to the application, it looks like this. I put a little bit more effort in this demo because otherwise it would, be, it would make no sense at all. What we have here is we have simple login. The thing I said you should never implement yourself. They handle login with their own users, um, login, logout, stuff like that. Very simple, very straightforward. Um, that's essentially how the application works. And if you look at the code, you will see that this is a fully independent application. So. The application here has a, bum, 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 a whole bunch of moving parts, but we have a list of users implemented very crappily. I <laughs> fully agree with that. We have a username, a password, and so on and so on. And that is what the application does. You just log in, you're authenticated, like I would do with Buffer, the online, uh, the social media scheduling tool. You just log in with an account, and that's it. And we're going to connect this to Restograde. And Restograde is its own application. It's an API which has review information. It has its own users. It has its own uh, set of uh, restaurants, a set of reviews, and so on and so on. And what we're basically going to do is we're going to connect those two applications together. And to do that, Virtual Foodie, our website that I've shown here in the browser, needs a token so it can call the Restograde API, so it can get reviews for whatever user is being connected. That's what we're trying to do with OAuth here. And if I click this button, Connect to Restograde, the application is going to run an OAuth flow to make that happen. It's going to run a flow which will result in asking uh, for tokens and make sure that that happens. Um, and before I do that, let me, let me sure we can log out so I can show you the full flow in action. All right, so if I click this button, the application is going to start another flow in OAuth flow this time, which ends up back here. Because to do that, Restograde has to know who I am so it can give tokens so that the API, the application of Virtual Foodie can access the API on my behalf. So if I log in here with that user, I have to provide consent. This is a third party scenario. We're basically giving a third party application access to my data stored in the Restograde application. So it's like, hey, do you want this application to read your reviews? And I'm like, yeah, that's fine. And off we go. So now we're connected. Nothing happened so far, but now we can start making API calls. So I can click this button, which means that in the backend, there's going to be an API call to Restorate, fetches my reviews, my list of reviews. Apparently, I have four reviews in an application, and my favorite restaurant style is meat restaurants. And that's based on the data that you can see here. So my reviews in the Restorate realm are located right here. We have four. Um, they're associated with restaurants, and based on the reviews, you can kind of see that the restaurant style definitely makes sense. So. Um, that's essentially what's going on right there. That is how these things are linked together and how that token connection works. That's OAuth. There's no user authentication involved. Yes, there was one in the step, in the flow. But this application, Virtual Foodie, doesn't really learn who I am. All it gets is a token. And if you look at the output of these applications right here, you can see 
that um, the Resigrid API is receiving some calls to look up reviews for user with ID something something. That's the user ID for that user on Restrogate. And that is mapped to reviews, and based on that, they know which reviews to collect. All right. Did I mention that OAuth is somewhat complicated? Well, there we go. All right. This scenario only uses OAuth. You'll find this in a lot of various scenarios. For example, buffer and LinkedIn social media scheduling. You'll find this whenever an application is asking uh, Google for permission to access your calendar, that's an OAuth flow. Some application somewhere is asking, like Zoom, is asking permission to integrate with your Google Calendar so they can read your events, they can schedule events, and they can add links to events and so on. That's an OAuth flow. Zoom is the client, Google is that security token service, Google has the Calendar API, and that's how these things work. And once you start watching this pattern, you'll find it literally everywhere, especially when you see that consent dialog pop up asking you, hey, do you want to allow this application to access that? That's definitely an OAuth flow happening right there. There's a third scenario. And that third scenario is where, or third use case, is where we combine the first two in one flow. Because OpenID Connect basically uses the flows from OAuth for a different purpose. And you can combine the two together. So you can handle something, a mobile app would be a good example. So the RestoGrade mobile app, where you can do your restaurant reviews and look up restaurants, that app could ask the STS, like, who is the user? And by the way, once you've told me who the user is, I also want a token so I can access some APIs to fetch reviews and so on and so on. That would be combining the two together in one flow where you can obtain user information and obtain that access token so you need, can access the APIs. That's essentially how these things are used in practice. It's all about tokens. So a client needs tokens. It needs an identity token to figure out who the user is. It needs an access token to access an API. Maybe there's a refresh token involved for like long-term access and so on and so on. We'll talk about all of that, by the way, no worries. But that's essentially what we need, tokens. And we get those tokens by running a flow or a grant in OAuth terminology. Like there's a whole bunch of flows or a whole bunch of grants that you can use, all different configurations for different use cases. And it's up to you to select the right one. And if you look at the specs, um, especially throughout the year since 2012, there's like a whole bunch of these flows. And it's like you have, you have the implicit flow, the resource owner, password credentials flow, or grant, the hybrid flow, and so on and so on. It's like an absolute mess, trust me. <laughs> it's pretty complicated, especially because some of these are deprecated. Some of these are like still valid, but no longer used because it's less practical than others. And you end up with like a a very complicated selection process, especially when you have legacy uh, or tech debt lying around with old flows and like, yeah, what do we do now and how do we handle this? The good news is things are being simplified at a rapid pace, especially the last three years. We scrapped a bunch of these things and very common today is the authorization code flow and the client credentials flow. These two are very, very common in a lot of scenarios and I'm sure if you've ever dealt with OAuth, uh, or OIDC, you've used one of these flows in practice. The other ones, um, apart from the deprecated ones, are still valid and are for specific use cases. I'm going to focus on these two in this presentation right here. All right. And by the way, you'll find some custom flows as well, uh, which we're not even going to talk about uh, remotely here. Let's talk about the authorization code flow. The one flow you should remember. The, one the second flow, the client credentials flow, is like super easy. So if you understand this one, you're done basically for this presentation, which is, which is good. So <laughs> five minutes of effort and then you can relax for the rest of the session. So how does the authorization code flow work? And that's where all the steps come into play and where that one arrow, the, the one from the bottom to the top, uh, becomes like super complicated. Let me walk you through the scenario I showed you before, um, where the user is clicking like a login button or a connect button. Where doing it generically now, and we're walking through the flow. What really happened in that demo I showed you before? Well, the first thing is the user does something to trigger the flow, like click the login button or click the connect to restrograde button, something that tells the backend in this case, like, hey, it's time to run an OAuth or OIDC flow, run an authorization code flow, make that happen, please. And that means that the backend is like, okay, if I want to run a flow, I have to send 
the flow to the security token service. So it's going to redirect the browser um, to make sure that the browser sends a request, the authorization request we call that, to initialize a flow. And the browser is going to follow that redirect, which results in request number three on top. So that's a redirect happening where the browser goes to that security token service. In the demos, you saw a login form. That security token service receives a request. It's like, hey, I would like to know who the user is. And the security token service is like, I don't know who the user is. Bam, login form. Like, hey, who are you? That's why the user is involved in that flow. That's why the flow goes through the browser. So we have user interaction whenever we need it. And the user is like, oh yeah, I'm Philip, and my password is fluffydog17 exclamation mark. That's not my real password, by the way. This is just a PowerPoint example, so don't try it on my accounts. I don't want to get like mails of just leave it alone. It's fine. It's a secure password, but it's not my real password. So <laughs> we can talk about that later. So I'm logging into that security token service. And when that happens, the security token service knows exactly who I am. If you sign in with Google, Google would ask you, hey, you want to log into your Google account, and then Google knows exactly who you are. And when we have done that, we send a something back to the client application at the bottom. And to send something back, the only way we can do that reliably is through the user's browser. So we send the browser another redirect in step six, and we tell the browser, like, you go back to the application, and when you do, follow this URL, and in the URL, there's a query parameter, and in that query parameter, there's an authorization code. Hence the name of the grant or the flow, authorization code flow. And that authorization code, the browser is like, yeah, I'll follow the redirect. And the request goes back to that backend. We call that the callback or the return uh, endpoint. And that backend gets a request, reads the query parameters, and now has an authorization code. And guess what? That authorization code means nothing. It's just a temporary value that only means something to the security token service, this one. So the backend application goes back there and it's like, hey, I got this authorization code from the browser in step seven in this case. What does that mean? By the way, I am the RestoGate backend or the virtual foodie application and I would like to get some tokens for this code. And the security token service will validate all of those parameters like, oh yeah, I gave this code for Philippe uh, like two minutes ago or two seconds ago. That's perfectly fine. And it provides the client application at the bottom with tokens. Like I said, generic. Uh, I'll talk about specific tokens in a second. And then the backend handles those tokens and we have completed the authorization code flow. So here we have 10 steps for that one single arrow in the triangle. Like the client, who is the user? Bam, 10 steps to get that done. But once you understand the interactions, these steps are not that complicated. This flow is generic for a reason because it supports both OAuth and OIDC scenarios. Depending on how you configure the different steps in that flow, I'm going to talk about that in a second, that's what kind of flow we are running. So let's talk about this flow for OIDC. What do we want to achieve with OIDC? I only just noticed the live captioning, that's awesome. <laughs> All right, live is with a V, by the way. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Bad AI. <laughs> yeah, th this is not going to end well. <laughs> if I disappear during the break, uh, please come find me. <laughs> All right, um, so what does this mean for OIDC? OpenID Connect is about user authentication. So it means that the user is doing something which involves authentication. So the interaction that triggers a flow is typically clicking a login button, sign in with Google, log in with your Azure Active Directory or whatever. That's the interaction pattern, the, the semantics of this flow. And then the rest is kind of the same. We send the, the redirect to the browser, the browser follows that to the STS, we authenticate to the STS with the same username and password as before. And we get that authorization code, it's an authorization code flow. The authorization code goes back to the browser, or to the, sorry, through the browser, back to the backend application in step seven. So we can exchange it for tokens in step eight. And then step nine is different. Or different, no, step nine is specific now because in step nine we receive an identity token. And that is a very precisely defined token in the OIDC specification that says like, at the end of an OIDC authorization code flow, you get this token. And that token contains these claims with some meaning and so on and so on. That's 
how you run an authorization code flow for OpenID Connect. All right. And then, of course, we can handle that token um, to authenticate the user. So what does this look like in specifics? If you want to see an actual request, I have that information on the slides as well. So the request in step two and three is the authorization request. That's the official name. It's basically the start of a flow. And that contains a whole bunch of parameters. You maybe have seen these in the past. It's like a very long URL with a bunch of parameters configuring the exact flow. The response type is code. That means we expect an authorization code at the end of this uh, interaction. We define an OpenID Connect flow. That means you add scope equals OpenID. That indicates to the STS here, I expect an identity token at the end of the code exchange. That's how you can recognize an OIDC flow. There's going to be scope equals OpenID, mandatory. No question about it. The other ones are optional. Profile and email are uh, signals to this STS saying like, hey, I would like to get some email information about the user and also include some profile information if you have it. That's how, if you sign in with Google to an application, how do you get your profile picture that you have in Google? That's uh, Google sending that uh, based uh, on this flow in that identity token. We also tell upfront which client we are. So every client that wants to run a flow with STS has to be registered with some configuration parameters and so on and so on. And here you indicate what client you are because this is an ID you have received before and that's essentially how you make that happen. The next value, redirect URI on line five, that's essentially the endpoint for step seven. Where do you want to receive that code? You can define multiple endpoints and you have to specify one of your predefined endpoints in this step. You have to say like, hey, I know you have a list of potential endpoints or sometimes just one. When you're done, send it to this uh, specific endpoint, please. And then line six and seven, I'm going to skip these for now. I'll explain them in five-ish minutes. So let me skip those security features. All right, that's how you start the flow. And then step three, uh, well, four and five, the user authentication, that one is not defined anywhere. OIDC is all about user authentication. And then in the spec, it says somewhere like, how you actually authenticate the user? Pfft, your problem, not ours. That's a you problem. You figure that out, whatever you think is fair. You can ask for a password, you can do uh, web authentication, pass keys, passwordless, magic links, whatever works for you, basically. But once you have figured out who the user is, that's when the protocol comes back into play, the flow, and that's step six and seven, that's sending the control back to the application. What do we have here? On line one, we have that callback we provided in the beginning. We said, like, when you're done, send the code here, bah, that's that endpoint, and then we have a query parameter, code equals something something. And that's the authorization code, that meaningless value. All right. At this point, that code ends up in our backend web application, which is going to exchange it for tokens in step eight. And that request looks like this. It's a post request, server to server in this case, a back channel request, where we indicate that we're trying to exchange an authorization code. We, we uh, identify ourselves as a client. So we're the client with this ID. And we authenticate as that client. This is a confidential client, meaning it has a secret, like a client password, to present. There might be some key-based authentication going on here, and we're not going to talk about that here today. But the client authenticates. That's a very important security measure. Client authenticates. We inform the SDS where we received that authorization code, the callback. Of course, we provide the authorization code itself. And then line 9, I'm going to skip that until later. And the response in step nine is a JSON response. ID token, the identity token, and that identity token is a JWT, JSON web token, and contains information about the authenticated user. And that's the end of the flow. The application can now open the token up, read the payload, which is a bunch of claims of what you basically asked. And one of these claims is mandatory. One of these claims is called SUB because the people that wrote the JOT spec have a fetish for three-letter abbreviations. Seriously, read the spec. <laughs> I, when I talk about JOTs in my training courses, I have a game like JOT, three-letter abbreviation bingo, where you people have to guess what these things mean. And some of them are easy and then it gets really complicated and like, I have no idea what CNF means and stuff like that. But the sub claim, the sub is a user identifier. That's the unique ID of the user that authenticated, the user here, Philippe, within the STS. So if you run this flow against your Azure Active Directory, 
your user in Azure AD has a unique ID that will only ever be used for your account, never reused, never duplicated. So whenever the client application receives an identity token and sees that ID, it knows like, hey, I know who that is. It's the user with this ID and internally we know him as Philippe. Okay, makes sense. And that's how authentication really works. And if you run this with Google, sign in with Google, and you run this today, you'll get an identity token with your Google ID as a subject. And you run it in five months, you'll get the same Google ID in a subject. And that Google ID will always be associated with your account. That's essentially how this works in practice. All right. Let's see that in action. Well, I would like to show you that in my demo application, you know, the one that wasn't very pretty, but to be honest, it's not very interesting to show you that in a demo app because it's like you see a redirect and then the app does some server-to-server -server communication that we can't really observe and then poof, there's an identity token. It, there's not much to show. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the different steps of the flow in like a simulator and I'm going to show you a little bit of application code right here. You can see that our users listed in this application have that ID that you recognize from before. So they have an ID that is known by the STS. So whenever the, the identity token comes back with a subject claim, that is essentially how we can figure that out. Another thing you can observe is I'm using a library, Express OpenID Connect, this is Node.js Express code, and that library does all of the heavy lifting. As in, I don't have to do anything, basically. I just tell the library, yeah, handle OIDC flows for me and make sure it happens, and off we go. So if you would look at the actual implementation, we provide it with a bunch of configuration parameters, like a client ID and a client secret, and the scopes that we would like, and that we run an authorization code flow here. And then everything else just magically happens, which is pretty awesome as a developer, pretty useless if you want to do a demo. So uh, that brings me to step number two. I've been doing a lot of demos on this, and one of the... One, one tool I built is called a flow simulator. And a flow simulator is intended to show you the steps of the flow, to visualize them in like a fake environment. So we're not really doing this as a backend web app. This is a front-end web app running in a browser, but it will show you the different steps. So what we can do here is we can configure our STS, which is running on sts.restway.com. That's my demo uh, implementation. And we can pretend to be a backend client application. And you can see that we have that client secret that I showed you before right here in the browser, which is a very bad idea. So if you ever want to do this yourself, this is a public tool, you can do it yourself, but please do not store production secrets uh, in your browser because, well, secu obvious security reasons. We want to run an authorization code flow, and I want to show you exactly what's going on. So in this authorization code flow, you can see four steps. That's essentially the things I showed you on the slides as well. We have the initialization, that's basically sending the control to the STS. We have the redirect back. We have the code that comes in that we exchange for tokens, and then we have the actual tokens. Um, let me also log out um, so I can actually show you the different steps. We'll talk about why we need to log out in a second. All right, so initialization of the flow. You can see the URL I showed you before right here at the bottom. That's that very long URL where you can recognize a bunch of values as well. You can see the scope, open ID, and email. We can add profile here as well. Um, and that's essentially how we start the flow. So if I do this, the flow will go to that STS. That's the STS asking like, hey, who are you? And I'm gonna be like, yeah, I'm Philippe and Fluffy Dog 17 exclamation mark, um, and so on and so on, and I'm gonna log in right here. And when I do, the flow goes back to that callback endpoint, which in this case takes us back to the flow simulator. And you can see that this is where the authorization code comes in. So we got a response that says code is some very long random string, whatever. All right, next step, exchange that code for tokens. So what do we do here? We send a post request. You can see the request at the bottom. A post request to this sts.resticrate.com. Grant type is authorization code, client ID, client secret, and so on and so on. All the values are there, including the code that we received in the previous request. And if we exchange this for tokens, then always happy when this works, we get a response with the identity token. That's the relevant one. Um, and the identity token looks like this. It's a JSON web token. Like I said, a very long token. Let's 
uh, decode it. If we drop it in here to decode it, you can see the information right here in purple. You can see that there's, let me highlight stuff. Um, you can see the SUB at the bottom, the SUB claim is this odd zero something something value. That's my account at odd zero. This identifier has never changed in our demos because it's still my account, the same account we've been using for all of these uh, examples before. You can also see email information. My email address is right there, um, no surprises. Uh, there, and we can see profile information, like a picture and nickname and name and all of that stuff. That's there because we asked for profile information. That's OpenID Connect, that's the identity token. So the application in our backend would open this up, extract these claims, match that SUB to the user with that specific ID, and initialize the user's profile. That's essentially how we know who that is. Or if you use sign in with Google, you would look up the user with this specific Google ID in your application, find their reviews, and so on and so on. That's OpenID Connect in action. All right. And as promised, I have a slide with a lot of text about the same thing. So mandatory is the OpenID scope. That's essentially how you signal that this flow is an OIDC flow. We get an identity token as a response. The SUB claim is always there. The other stuff is optional, depends on uh, what information is there. In the OpenID Connect specs, you'll find two other flows. You'll find an implicit flow and a hybrid flow. These are not officially deprecated, as in they are still valid, but they are much more difficult to implement. Because if you implement these flows, you have to do some checks on the client side instead of checks being done by the STS. So you have more responsibilities and more places to screw it up, if you want to put it bluntly. So the advice today is that we use the authorization code flow. That's the current best practice. If you, want to, you have one of these other flows, consider upgrading to the authorization code flow. It's the current best practice. It's the most secure configuration, especially when you implement it securely, as we'll talk about in the next topic of this presentation. All right. What about OAuth? Well, the good news is the flow is the same. It's the same authorization code flow, just a tiny few differences of based what we are trying to achieve. The semantics are different. The user is no longer authenticating. The user is now connecting an account to an application, like connect Restorgate to Virtual Foodie, connect your Google Calendar to Zoom. We're not authenticating, we're connecting accounts. That's one difference. Everything else, more or less the same. We send that authorization request. We go back, I'm gonna skip through the steps here because well, it's the same. We Authenticate as user, if necessary, we'll talk about that later. We get an authorization code, which goes back to the backend, which is exchanged for tokens. Step nine is different now. In step nine, we now get an access token. No identity token, but an access token. And that access token allows us to access an API. So in step 10, we can now send a request to the rest of the API saying like, hey, get me the reviews for whatever user is associated with this token, and the API will get to that. The API will use that access token, well, here. API uses the access token here to make authorization decisions. In the access token, there's gonna be a claim, SUB, which contains the user's identifier. So the API is gonna be like, who's the user? Who is this token associated with? Gets that user identifier, that out 060 something something value, looks up in the list of reviews, which reviews are associated with this user and gets that list back to the requesting application. That's essentially how this works. And we'll talk about how APIs do that towards the end of this session, if we get there. We should. All right, that's the OAuth flow. What's different? Well, a lot of it is the same. Um, what's different is in this, uh, in this slide is line number three, so this is the same. Line number three is different because we don't include that OpenID scope anymore because we're not running an OpenID flow. Instead, we can use an OAuth scope and I'll talk about scopes at the end, I'm gonna ignore that for now. Everything else is essentially the same. All right, the response is different as well. Well, the code exchange, I haven't shown that, that's identical. The response is slightly different because we now have an access token, which can be a JSON web token, more on that later. And we have an expires in property that signals the lifetime of that access token, telling the client like, hey, this access token is valid for one hour. Up to you to decide what you wanna do with that. And there's some additional info here as well. That is the authorization code flow for OAuth, which is the same as for OIDC. 
which is just the authorization code flow. All right. Again, slide with text summary. Um, we have run this, as I said, with a confidential client, meaning a client that can authenticate. And that means when we exchange that code for tokens, as a client, we are supposed to authenticate. And that's a security measure. And that's to avoid one of you from seeing that authorization code on my screen here and be like, oh, I'm going to really fast uh, write it over and exchange it for tokens, and I'm, I'm going to be able to steal your tokens. Because if you try to do that without authenticating as the client, it's not going to work. And that client secret for authentication is typically stored securely on a server where you can't really access it. So even if you would steal an authorization code from somewhere as an attacker, you can't directly exchange it because you don't have access to the client secret. You can see the client ID, that's public info, but not the client secret. All right. Authorization code has some additional security measures. It's one-time use only meaning if you try to, or if you exchange it once, you can't do it again. So even if you find an authorization code later on, you can't exchange it, not even with the client's uh, credentials. And authorization codes are typically short-lived as well. That's an additional security measure. Short-lived is open for interpretation. Uh, ideally, that would be like seconds, maybe a minute. Um, in reality, you'll find authorization codes being valid for half an hour, an hour, and so on. I'm gonna leave that in the middle for today. Usually I ask, are there any questions, but that's not going to work well in this room. Um, so if you have any questions, you can harass me in the break or after the session. That is perfectly fine. I say harass lovingly, by the way. So, uh, All right. If you want more complexity, I have that right here for you. Let's talk about Pixie. The authorization code flow relies on an insecure front-end channel, which is a very fancy way of saying the browser sucks. That's essentially what this comes down to. So we're sending this authorization code through the browser, and we know that it's insecure because anybody can read it in a browser. You as a user can read it. You can copy-paste stuff into the wrong channels, whatever. The browser is considered to be not a very secure channel. Compared to server-to-server -server communication, the browser is very insecure. And there are some scenarios involving browsers, but also mobile apps and so on, where the authorization code is subject to attacks. And one of these attacks is called an authorization code injection attack, which sounds pretty cool, but it's horribly complicated. I'm going to do my best and explain it uh, on a slide so you can actually try to understand what's going on. Remember when I said that if the attacker steals the authorization code, they can't use it? That is still true. So let's imagine that there's a flow where the, the user is, or the, the client is running this um, for the user, and the user um, authenticates with Philip and Fluffy Dog 17 exclamation mark and so on, and we get that authorization code, and that authorization code goes back to that client application, right? If the attacker manages to steal that authorization code, we're a bit in a bit of trouble. And this happens, in this case, it's a bit weird. Um, because it would require network level access, so it's it's difficult, but not impossible. Browser extensions would be a good way to handle this as well. Um, so it's not impossible, but on, on mobile apps, which we're not really going to talk about much today, on mobile apps this can happen more common. But the attacker can't really exchange this. In this scenario, if the attacker would go directly from here to here, the security token service would be like, hey, where's your client secret? If you claim to be the retrograde backend, like, where's your client secret? And the target's like, I don't have it. Maybe they can guess, but it's not going to work very well trying to guess that client secret. However, the attacker can do something called a code injection. And the code injection is basically the attacker taking a URL to the callback endpoint and inserting a stolen code right there. Or even inserting their own code in that URL and sending it to a user. That's the, the, the flip side of that scenario. Basically injecting an, an authorization code into a legitimate callback URL. And if you give that to the backend, the backend is going to be like, ooh, I get a callback on my endpoint, and the code is right here, and I'm going to exchange that code for tokens, and something is going to go wrong. Either we're going to associate the user's tokens with the attacker's account, or we're going to associate the attacker's tokens with the user account. Anyway, something really bad is happening right here. And this attack works, this code injection works, because the backend will authenticate on step seven. The backend here is kind of naive, 
didn't implement the proper security measures because there are protections against this in the spec, but the backend didn't implement them correctly, which happens more than you want to know. And they're exchanging that authorization code mistakenly, causing problems. Code injection. Don't break your head about the details. They're not very important. What you should know is that you need to augment the authorization code flow with Pixie. Because Pixie solves this problem once and for all. You know what the best part of Pixie is? You are not responsible for checking it. All you need to do is use it, and that security token service is responsible for checking it. Which is, a, that's a win basically. All you have to do is like, yeah, yeah, handle security, and bam, you get security for free, or almost for free. So what is Pixie, and how does it work? St bear with me, this is slightly complicated, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that. What's the concept of Pixie? What are we trying to achieve here? Let me start with that. Because if you get lost in the details, then at least you understand what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to assure that we are st starting the flow in step two in the same client instance as we're exchanging the code in step eight. Meaning we're trying to preserve the integrity of the entire flow between step two and eight, which are two distinct things. One is like the stuff in the insecure front end in the browser, and the other is exchanging a code for tokens. And in our attack scenario, the attacker was right in the middle. They did one in one scenario and then move the value to the second scenario and exchange the code here. And what we're gonna do with Pixie is we're gonna tie these together so that becomes impossible. That's the concept of Pixie, all right? Linking the initialization of the flow to the exchange of the code. So if you don't remember anything else from Pixie, that's what it does. Linking step two to step eight in my slides. All right, how do we do that? By adding some junk into the flows. We do that by adding a random or calculating a random value. And that random value is called the code verifier. But just think of it as your little secret. You're the application now, or we're the application. We're gonna run a flow for a user and we're gonna calculate our little secret. And we're gonna keep it for this user specifically. Like John is gonna run a flow and for John, we're gonna calculate a random value called the code verifier. So here's John starting the flow, and we're gonna calculate that code verifier. I'm gonna keep it secure. We're gonna drop it in John's session cookie, for example. Makes sense. Or store it in a database associated with John's account, but the cookie is the easiest in practice. And now we're gonna to prove to the SDS that we actually know a secret without telling it what a secret is. And we do that by calculating the hash of that code verifier. And we call that the code challenge. Because why make it simple when <laughs> it's so odd? We call that the code challenge. And we basically calculate the hash. And if you know something about hash functions, it's easy to go from data to the hash, but it should be hard or impossible to go back from the hash to the data, except by brute forcing. So if I give you a hash, there's no way for you to tell what I used as input for that hash. Could be one bit of information, could be 15 gigabytes of data, up to you to guess. And if it's 15 gigabytes, good luck guessing that, uh, that data. It's impossible. So what we're gonna do with that code challenge in step three is we're gonna include that in a flow. We're gonna start the flow in step four, which used to be step two. And we're gonna tell the STS like, we are running a flow here and we have a little secret that we're not gonna tell you just yet, but here's some proof that we had it because we used it to calculate a value that we can only calculate if we have that value. And that's how we initialize the flow. And the STS is gonna be like, okay, you claim to have a secret, we'll see about that. But first, we'll do whatever we do, we authenticate the user, and we send an authorization code back. And before we send that authorization code back, we're gonna store that code in the database, as we've always done, and now we're gonna associate your hash with that authorization code. Like you said you knew a secret, well, when you come back later, we'll verify that. But for now, we're good. And we get that authorization code, which goes back to the backend, in step 10, and our backend application is now gonna exchange the code for tokens. And in this step, it says like, hey, I got this code, and I'm this client, and you know what? When I asked for this code, I proved that I possessed the secret. Here's that secret now. You can verify that. You can check that I'm the real client, because when I started a flow, I had this secret, because I gave you the hash. Now I'm proving to you that I had the secret. And the STS is like, yeah, we'll see about that. That's what you say. And it's gonna recalculate the hash. It's gonna take that secret that the client provides in step 11, 
code verifier is going to calculate the SHA-256 hash, which is always the same if the input is the same, and it's going to compare that to the hash stored in step 8. And if these hashes are identical, then it is indeed the right client. And that means that the client has received this authorization code in step 10. For John, it's associated with the same flow that was started in 4, and everybody's happy and we get the tokens. And if the attacker comes back with their code injection attack, they're going to insert an authorization code somewhere else. And that somewhere else is not going to have the right code verifier. It's not going to have the right secret. So the STS at some point will be like, yeah, nice try, go away. And that's how we protect the integrity of the flow with Pixie. All right. What does that look like in practice? We've seen that, but I'm going to reiterate that just for good measure. In that initialization step in four, Imagine that it says four here. Just roll along with it. Seriously, if you build a lot, I've rebuilt a lot of slides for this, and there's always a lot of uh, some details missing. So uh, my apologies for that. But in this step, you can see in step line six the code challenge. That is the base64 URL encoded hash of a secret. And you can also see a code challenge method. That's the hash function we used. There's like only one relevant hash function, SHA-256, but it's for upgradability because in the future you want to use SHA-3 or whatever, and then you can just gradually upgrade as we go along. But that's how we signal that in step four here, and also which goes there in step uh, five. Good. How do we provide that secret? Well, that's a code verifier here in step nine. So the code verifier here, uh, oh, line nine, sorry, in step 11, that code verifier, that's a secret that we send right there. That's a secret that we used before uh, that we calculated in step number two. And that's Pixie for you. All right. Some details. Pixie has the code verifier and the code challenge. The code verifier is that little secret that you calculate. It's a random value between four, uh, 43 and 128 characters of length from the character set A to Z, uppercase, lowercase, numbers, dash, dot, whatever, details. I mean, <laughs> that's how you calculate that. And then the code challenge is the base64 URL encoded SHA-256 hash of that value. Keyword here, URL encoded. Trust me, if you've ever implemented this and you missed that tiny detail, it takes you like an hour of debugging to realize that you're using the wrong encoding, and that's why it doesn't work. But once you get there, this works quite nicely. And then it ensures that the same client initializes the flow and finalizes the flow. It ties the steps together and it offers strong protection against inject or flow attacks, uh, flow injection attacks, or other integrity-based attacks. And back in the day, when you're doing um, OAuth, you were supposed to use a state parameter for this purpose. And if you were doing OIDC, there's a nonce value for this purpose. And Pixie replaces both, basically. So if you use Pixie, you can forget about state and forget about nonces. Pixie handles flow integrity. And Pixie is a rock solid best practice. All right. Has become a security best practice for all authorization code flows. Many advantages to it, so absolutely highly recommend it. All right. By now, you're probably thinking like, holy crap. If I have to implement all of that, that doesn't sound like a good day. That sounds like a nightmare. Well, here's some good news. Modern libraries handle all of the heavy lifting. In a modern library, you don't really have to implement all of these details. If you saw the library I've been using before in the OIDC demo, it's like, hey, run a flow, please. Handle this for me. And the library does everything. Here's a couple of examples. If you want to build a Java Spring application, there's a whole lot of Spring sessions here. Spring has support for Pixie built in. So Generating the code verifier, keeping track of it, um, sending the code challenge, and all of that stuff is integrated right there. Here's an example from Passport.js, a Node.js library, Pixie support built in. Pixie has been around for a while, and library support. And then .NET has something similar. And I stopped here with finding examples, but we could keep going on and on about this. Pixie is well supported. The OAuth flows are well supported. So today, as a developer, you implement this with a library and you're good to go. So all of the heavy lifting, including the flows and the callback and the code and all of that stuff is handled by libraries. And that makes your life pretty awesome, actually. Good. Let's look at Pixie in action. <laughs> 
The easiest way for me to show you how Pixie works is by running a flow in the flow simulator. So let's do what we've been doing so far. We run an authorization code flow as a confidential client. And when we initialize the flow, we have a toggle here that enables Pixie. And if you enable Pixie for this flow, you can see that we add the parameters here, the code challenge and the code challenge method. That's how we signal to the STS that we are using Pixie and how we do that. All right. When I initialize this flow, remember we're authenticated from before and there's an active session between our browser and STS, so we don't have to authenticate again. I'll talk about what that means in, um, in a bit in the presentation, but for now, this means we'll just skip ahead to receiving the authorization code. Boom. Here's the authorization code. This hasn't changed from before. It's just the code as we've always had. When we exchange the code for tokens, that's where things change, because now we have a code verifier listed right here. This was a random value that we calculated in the beginning that we will now present to the STS to prove that we are the right clients. And we've exchanged that code for tokens. You can see that we obtain our tokens, just like before. That's Pixie in action. Now, what does this mean? Let's do this again. And let's tamper with Pixie. So we initialize the flow. We enable Pixie. Not this one, Pixie, there we go. We receive our code, just like before, and I'm gonna copy this command, and I'm gonna run this in a terminal. Let me make this a bit bigger. So now, this is the command that would be exchanged by the Flow Simulator or by the backend web application. What we're gonna do is we're gonna temper with the code verifier. Let's change the one into a two, because why not? What this means is that we're presenting a different secret value, like our little secret, all of a sudden it's different and it will not match the hash that is stored by the security token service and this should blow up in our face with a, an error. And it does, that's a good thing, always happy when it does. Uh, and it says, uh, invalid grant failed to verify the code verifier. So the STS was like, yeah, yeah, let's see if your secret actually matches the hash that we have stored with that authorization code. They recalculated the hash, which is different now because even changing one tiny bit in the data's input will result in a different hash. That's a property of a hash function. And the hash is different now, and that means that the exchange fails. And this should also illustrate that the authorization code is one-time use only. I believe, I, if I remember correctly, that it's now invalid, which is kind of a decision of the STS. They can implement this however they want. But if you try to do this, it will fail um, because it basically says like, hey, we're trying to exchange that code, but it's no longer valid. And that's essentially what's going on. And if we would go at our Alt0 tenant, this is my Restrograde Alt0 tenant I use for demos, so there's nothing sensitive in there. If you look at the logs, you will see this as a security event as well. There's a failed exchange right here, stating that our demo backend is trying to do this, and it said failed to verify code verifier. This is something, to be honest, that you don't really want to see in your logs because no legitimate case will ever end up on this, unless you have an implementation error somewhere this is very likely to be some malicious behavior of somebody tampering with that information. All right. Good. I've been talking for a while now, based on my timer. So um, what I want to do next is, as a short little break in the presentation, I want to run a little quiz. So in my trainings, I often run uh, Kahoot quizzes uh, to recap what we talked about so far. Um, which people always uh, have great fun with. Now, there's one thing I didn't really calculate for. Um, I only realized that when I saw the room fill up. Um, I'm not sure if my account can handle so many people. So uh, we'll, see. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Usually my groups are smaller. Um, so what you're supposed to do is you take out a device, um, like a cell phone or a laptop, whatever, and join our Kahoot quiz by scanning the QR code or entering the pin. And then you can, um, we can see how well you grasped this OAuth knowledge here. And if you can't join, my apologies uh, for that. Just play ahead along in your head and get a perfect score for everything so you win, uh, of course. Yeah. It's fluffy dog, not fluffy cat. Ju just saying. 
This is the first time I actually can check Kahoot's implementation limits, so uh, we'll see. That's interesting. I thought, that, well, they claim the limit is 100, so uh, apparently we're good. So <laughs> no need to upgrade. That's awesome. All right, what's going to happen next is there's five questions, um, multiple choice, either true, false, or like four answers where you have to pick the correct one. If you're right, you get points. And if you're fast and right, you get more points. So um, that's basically how, how this works. All right. I guess most of you are here. Okay, apparently not. So let's give let's give it a minute. It's fine. Good. People people leaving and choosing other nicknames. That's <laughs> that's all fine. Good. Always a good indicator of how serious people are. So I've had workshops where people have played with their own name for two days straight, and there's other workshops where after the first quiz, it, it just goes down the drain with stuff like SQL injection and things like that. So yeah, <laughs> I've been doing this for a while. I haven't seen Kahoot fail, so that, that's a good thing. Yeah. All right, let's go. Um, if you're still joining, you'll pop up uh, as we go along. Like I said, five questions about understanding OAuth and OpenID Connect. All right. True or false? OAuth and OpenID Connect can be used together. What do you think about that? That's awesome, wow. Um, that's true, so one of the use cases was OIDC separately, OAuth separately, or a flow where you combine two together. So if you ask for an OpenID scope and an OAuth scope, you're running the same flow for dual purposes. You'll get an identity token and an access token in the same response, and you can do whatever you need to do with that in practice. All right, DevOps is fun, I agree. So uh, that's pretty awesome. Number two, which token is specific to OpenID Connect? All right, then things get a little bit more complicated. So the identity token is specific to OpenID Connect. You only get an identity token if you're running an OIDC flow. It does not exist anywhere in the OAuth specs. It only exists in the OpenID Connect core specification. That's where it's defined, where the meaning is explained, and so on. So that's not an OAuth thing. That's an OIDC thing. All right, number three. Which token does the client use to access an API? All right, good. API access is the access token. That's an OAuth token. That also has a specific meaning in OpenID Connect, which we're not really gonna talk about. But that's essentially what the client presents to an API when trying to access it and what the API uses to make authorization decisions, which we'll talk about later on. All right. You can see minor changes here. Um, let's go to number four, true or false. Pixie is a best practice to preserve the integrity of an authorization code flow. Is that true or false? 
Good. Awesome job. So that's absolutely what Pixie does. Um, it's about flow integrity. It replaces the state parameter or the nonce in OpenID Connect flows, which were co-opted to preserve flow integrity, but Pixie solves the problem uh, in the core of the flow, which is a much better approach, by the way. All right. The top two stays the same. So it's, it's tied at the top for the first place. So we have one more. Let's see if that makes a difference. Final question. What temporary value do OAuth clients exchange for tokens? What's the right one here? All right, this is where things get a bit more interesting. So the authorization code flow essentially returns a temporary authorization code to the client, which gets exchanged for tokens in the code exchange. That's essentially how this works. Client credentials are involved, but they're not temporary values. They're actually specific values for a client. The redirect URI is present in the exchange, but it doesn't really get exchanged for tokens because that's the authorization code. And the sign challenge um, kind of decoy the authorization code is whatever the SDS wants it to be. So it's not typically signed, it's just a random value stored somewhere. And that brings us to the podium, a five out of five for the top three. So that's absolutely a good job. And we'll see who takes first place. You get zero prizes for that, by the way. So uh, just, just take the honor of it um, and claim it by making a screenshot. Otherwise, nobody will believe your MHA, uh, but <laughs> all right. And let me grab a picture as well, because this is definitely the biggest Kahoot I've run uh, so far. So that's, uh, that's pretty awesome. I want to get one from the screen as well. Usually the presentation screen is not that big. Uh, it's a bit smaller. All right. Great. If you have some time towards the end, um, I don't know yet if we'll get there, uh, but if you have some time towards the end, then we'll run another one. All right, let me go on for a bit and let me check in a bunch of slides. In I think in about half an hour, we'll have a break, um, 15 minute break where you can stretch your legs and take care of other business that needs taken care of. I'll leave it in the middle what that is. Uh, Maybe some of you have an addiction that you want to satisfy. That's, that's all fine. All right, so that was the basics. The authorization code flow, how to get tokens. What about long-term access? Remember use cases I talked about, like Zoom having access to your Google Calendar or Buffer, the social media scheduling tool, trying to access um, LinkedIn or Mastodon in my name. That typically requires long-term access, as in days, weeks, months, eternity, and that's where refresh tokens come into play. Because the access token that you use to access APIs is not supposed to be valid for like two years. That's not really a best practice. Instead, the SDS can give you a refresh token, and that refresh token allows you to get a fresh access token. That's essentially what this means. And to do that, you run a refresh token flow. And a refresh token flow, from now on the flows get simpler, significantly simpler. And the refresh token flow looks as follows. The client, in this case, our backend web application, goes to the SDS and is like, hey, I got a refresh token from before. By the way, I'm this client, client ID, client secret. Can I get a fresh access token? And the SDS will look up that refresh token and be like, oh yeah, I gave that to Philip three days ago or five weeks ago. And yeah, this is still valid. Of course you can get a fresh access token. And there we go. And now the backend can access the API with that access token and everybody is happy. That's essentially how this works. The client decides when to use a refresh token. Gives you some flexibility in implementation. You can monitor API responses, just throw a request to the API, um, and if the API comes back like, hey, your token is expired, you can be like, oh yeah, whoops, my bad. Go to the STS, you get a refresh token, get a fresh one, and make the call again. Or you could be a little bit smarter, and you could implement a preemptive check with the expires in parameter. 
So the response from before would include an expires in, like, hey, this access token expires in an hour. So the application could implement something that says like, hey, if I make a request after that hour, I know that I have to run a refresh token flow first, so I'm going to do it first before sending the request to the API. That's definitely possible. As a client, you can make things simpler for yourself as well. Instead of storing access tokens and checking expiration, a, a, a tool like Buffer, they don't need frequent access. They don't need to hit the LinkedIn API every three seconds or every minute. I don't post that often, like maybe once or twice a day, and even then uh, I have long periods of silence. So that makes no sense to keep track of the access token. It's going to be expired anyway the next time you need it, so why keep track of it at all? And that's where the application can actually decide, I'm only going to store refresh tokens. And you know what? Whenever I need to make a call, I'm going to de facto use the refresh token with a refresh token flow, so we can actually get a fresh access token and make the request that we need to make. That's also an implementation scenario we can do in practice. And that's actually um, what I implemented in one of the demos um, as well. But there's, to, to be honest, there's not much, much, not much interesting to see about using a refresh token. It's making a request, getting a response, reading the JSON, and dealing with it. So we're not going to dive into the details right there. Let's talk about some interesting tidbits. How do you store a refresh token? Well, refresh tokens are kind of sensitive. Imagine your buffer and you store refresh tokens for LinkedIn and Mastodon access. I mean, if somebody gets those tokens, they can access my LinkedIn profile. That's maybe not ideal. Depends on what you want to. If you want to run crypto scams, then that would be ideal. But for me as a user, probably not. And that indicates the importance of protecting refresh tokens. And this use case is very relevant because Buffer actually had kind of a problem before where they were breached and somebody stole their refresh tokens. Actually, the story is a bit more nuanced as in Buffer was using a third party to run their data storage and that third party got breached and Buffer was the victim and so on and so on. But in a nutshell, the attackers stole refresh tokens. They can be like, yeah, but doesn't the client need to authenticate to use a refresh token? It's like, yes, that's correct. If an, if an attacker would steal use SQL injection, steal refresh tokens from a database, they can't really use them without the client credentials. The attacker would be stuck with refresh tokens that they can't use. But in Buffer's case here, the attacker also got their client secret for, I don't remember which, one, which it was, I think Twitter and Facebook. And with that client secret, of course, they could exchange the refresh token for access tokens. And with the access token, they could access people's accounts and start posting spam uh, very fast. And this was a bunch of cleanup. This is 10 years ago, by the way. So uh, Buffer has stepped up their security since, but this shows you how relevant it is to protect your refresh tokens. It should be considered as sensitive as user credentials, because better safe than sorry in this case. So you should store a refresh token in an encrypted format, not just in plain text in the database. All right. Of course, if the attacker gains access to your encryption keys and your secret and so on, we are still in massive trouble. So a better pattern here or a better solution would be to move refresh tokens out of your main application into a separate service. The token refresh service, something you can run inside your application architecture, but as a separate service with a separate data store, which just maps refresh tokens to users or whatever, and there you'd handle the token exchange. That means you can isolate that part, means the breach here doesn't automatically compromise all the refresh tokens, and that helps you to secure this in practice. That compartmentalization is a really useful approach to move the sensitive data out of your main application storage into a separate service, which you can better protect and better shield. All right. How does a client get that refresh token? Well, that refresh token is returned in step 13 in this slide. So the SDS, Where's my highlighter here? The STS decides to return a refresh token right here in the flow alongside an access token and maybe an identity token. Depends on the configuration of the flow. Now, how you get that refresh token there, there's no consensus on that. Sometimes you can just configure the STS as the administrator. You can be like, hey, if this client asks for tokens, always give it a refresh token. That would be one option. Another option that's often used is the client asks for a refresh token at the start of a flow, 
by including a scope called offline access. And that offline access scope represents the scenario we talked about. Like Buffer would like to have access to LinkedIn when I'm offline, when I'm not actively running flows to gift tokens, but just offline when the user is not present. And that's the meaning of that scope. But this is not standardized that well, so it depends a bit on the implementation on how this is actually handled in practice. All right. Brings us to another question. What's the lifetime of a refresh token? And that's where things, where we basically end up in the land of the free. We went from like, this is what the spec says, to like open-ended scenarios. And this question is perfectly a perfect example of open-endedness. Nobody knows. Whatever you think is a good lifetime. There we go. That's it. Seriously. <laughs> that's, uh, it's fully at the discretion of the STS. Some applications have eternity as a lifetime of a refresh token. Some applications, like LinkedIn, have a short lifetime of two or three months. I know that because after a couple of months, Buffer comes back to me with a mail saying, uh-oh, we couldn't post your LinkedIn profile. And I have to go back to Buffer and click the connect to LinkedIn button, which will run an authorization code flow with LinkedIn, so Buffer can get fresh tokens, so they have access again. But ultimately, it's at the discretion of the STS. They can be hours, months, eternity. The SES can change it whenever they want. And they can make it dependent on the type of client. You can say like, hey, this client never really needs long-term access. That's not the use case that we're implementing here. So you get a refresh token for eight hours. Or this client, like, oh yeah, they need long-term access. You get an eternity to refresh token or something in the middle. Or you can have inactivity timeouts. Like if you, it's valid for two weeks, but if you haven't used it in two days, then we're going to invalidate it anyway, and things like that. So there's a lot of flexibility in how you implement specifically, so you can match your use cases. If you're a client, you should also be aware that a refresh token can become invalid at any point in time through revocation. That's what you often see in these social scenarios. If I would go to LinkedIn, in my account settings, there's going to be a setting that says like connected applications and buffer is going to be there. And in LinkedIn, I can be like, yeah, bam, delete. And that will basically, LinkedIn will invalidate buffer's refresh token. So next time buffer goes there, LinkedIn is going to be like, ah, nice try, go away. Invalid refresh token and access is gone, basically. So buffer will no longer have access in my name unless I grant it again through a front channel flow where I can consent to giving Buffer that access. So that's how refresh token revocation works. Clients can also revoke uh, tokens themselves. So for example, in um, the scenario I showed you before, where we can disconnect Restrograde from Virtual Foodie, um, we actually do a token revocation step. We go back to Restrograde and say like, yeah, we got this refresh token before, but the user is telling us that they don't really want this anymore, so you know what, let's invalidate it. Let's make sure that you no longer accept it in the future and we can fully blow up our connection until the user decides to grant it again. That's essentially what you can do in practice with refresh tokens. When a token is no longer valid, and I mentioned this a few times, the only path to recovery is running a flow where the user is present again. Front channel, user interaction, either with an ongoing active session that's still there, we'll talk about that in the next slide, or where the user authenticates again and gives consent again and moves forward. But once a refresh token is invalid, it's no longer valid, there's no offline recovery. That's why Buffer sends me that email or notification like, oh, oh we couldn't connect to LinkedIn. That's why we need, they need to send that message, so I have to be present to allow them to access LinkedIn again. All right. Session reuse and single sign-on sounds like a highly complicated topic, but actually we've seen this, uh, just, just a couple of facts I want to point out, uh, but we've seen all of this in action and this, all, of, all of this makes perfect sense and you're probably fully aware of how this is going on as well. I just want to highlight this in our presentation right here. So whenever we run that flow, I've always shown you like Philippe authenticates with Fluffy Dog 17 and so on and so on, but I only have to do it once. And then my browser establishes an authenticated session between me and the STS, sts.restrograde.com. And that session is based on cookies and those cookies keep track of who I am. 
And that's why in the flow simulator, we haven't re-authenticated, we just got the authorization code. That's essentially why, because there is an active session which is used for reusing or running a flow without user interaction. And here's what that means. So whenever we run that authorization code flow, and that was, that's what we have seen in action, um, the browser goes to the security token service, the browser has a cookie from before, from earlier, includes that cookie in this request number three, right here. The SDS looks it up, it's like, oh yeah, you're Philippe from five minutes ago, I know who you are. And it just responds with an authorization code, bam. So this is something you don't even see in modern browsers, especially with good internet, like here at the conference. It's just like a redirect with an immediate redirect back. So you don't even see a white flash, it's just like, bam, done. And the only way to see that is going into the network tools of the browser and looking at the requests or using the flow simulator, which I've built for reasons exactly like this. And now, of course, we go back in step five to the callback endpoint with the authorization code. We exchange it for tokens and we uh, go back. And that's essentially how you run that flow um, with an existing user session. All right. One of the benefits of this approach is that you can use this for things like single sign-on. If you have a bunch of enterprise applications, if you log into your company and you have the HR management application and payroll and lunch ordering application and whatever else you're running, I don't work for an employer, so I have no idea, uh, whatever else you're running internally, you log in once in the morning and then every other application uses single sign-on. That's because if you did this step on top for one application and the second one runs a flow, that same session will be reused as long as you're in the same browser. That's how single sign-on works. That's also when you do sign in with Google, you don't really have to sign in with Google because everybody is logged into Google anyway. That's essentially what that means. All right, this session is at the discretion of the STS. That's the responsibility of the STS. Managing that session is not defined in any spec. Um, it's up to the STS to handle that as they see fit. Nobody enforces any restrictions here. If you have an STS, you can force user authentication every time. Why not? You can set session timeouts if you want to. You can do whatever you want in these steps. They are not defined in any spec. Um, and basically, it's up to you to see how you want to handle that. Terminating that session requires an explicit logout, as you've seen me do in a few of the demos as well. So I have did an explicit logout. That's where you go to the STS and you tell the STS, I want to terminate my session with you. That means the next time you go there, there's no active session, you have to authenticate again to do something useful. That's logging out at the STS. And that brings us to a second scenario called single logout. I'm not gonna go into detail here, but one of the things you can decide is to force a logout across all applications. So if I'm gonna go to the STS at your company, if you go to the STS and you terminate your session there, Maybe all of the clients that authenticated you through that STS also want to terminate your session. Maybe that makes sense because otherwise, what's the point of logging out? And that's called single logout. And that's a, a bit of a complicated scenario. There's two ways for the STS to do that and so on. But that's also a possibility. Um, it's not mandatory to do that. It's not often. Well, it depends on the use case of whether it's implemented or not. For example, sign in with Google is not going to implement single logout because imagine you logging out from your Google account and every other application that you sign in with Google so all of a sudden logs you out. That's probably not desirable. But in an enterprise setting, that definitely makes sense. All right. There's no official link between session lifetimes and token lifetimes. So your active session with the STS can be valid for an hour and your refresh token can be valid for eternity. There's no requirement to link these together. Sometimes they are linked, depends again on the implementation. Like this slide is all options and no, no um, mandatory guidelines. It's all possibilities. Depends on what you're implementing. Depends on how sensitive things are. And depends on how far you want to push things. All right. The client can also control user interaction. OpenID Connect introduces a prompt parameter. And the prompt parameter, parameter can be used to tell the STS whether you want to avoid user interaction, even when there's no session, do not prompt the user, or whether you want to force the user to log in, or you want to force the user to, um, to agree to a consent dialogue. You can control that a bit. And the prompt parameter fits into the flow in step two, 
The client can here um, set prompt, for example, to none. That's a request parameter because obviously OAuth likes request parameters. So that's how you signal the SDS like, hey, I want to set prompt to none, meaning that even if there is no active session, do not show a login dialog. If there's a session, give me a code. If there's no session, just give me an error message so I know about that and I can deal with that um, myself. And that's the SDS handles that based on the parameter. And I can show you what the effect is of this. All right. Guess how we're going to show that? With the flow simulator, of course. So we're not, are we logged in? Yes, we are logged in. We have an error here for because we tampered with Pixie, but we still have an ongoing session with the STS. So um, let's log out to kill that session. There we go. So now we have logged out of the STS. So there's no active session going on. If we start a new flow, pum, 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 we are still the same clients. That will change uh, after the break, I think, or maybe before. I don't know. I should know, but I don't know every one of my 120 slides by heart. So if you run a flow, let's run one with Pixie. We can control user interaction by setting, uh, toggling this thing right here, and we can set prompt to none. And you can see this in the URL. Now we have a prompt equals none parameter added at the end. And what this means is we will go to the STS. The STS is like, I don't have a session. I don't know who you are. And it's going to send us an error message instead of prompting us for a login form. So let's do that and see this here. And you can see that the error message is login required and the error description is human readable login required. And it basically tells the client like, yeah, we tried. You told us not to bother the user. We failed. Here's the error message. That's essentially what that means. All right. This is useful for running things like silent flows, bootstrap flows. For example, a client could choose when it loads, like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to run a flow with prompt set to none just to see if there's an active session. If there is one, I'll get my identity token and I know who the user is and I can just immediately authenticate them without them having to click a login button. That's one of the use cases we have with this flow, running a silent authentication flow. Allows the app to bootstrap itself with tokens and not prompt the user for logging in. All right. Let me check. No, we'll talk about other client types before the break, um, which is coming in like 10-ish minutes. Hold on for a little bit longer. You can do it. I believe in you. Um, and it's all on the record, by the way, so <laughs> that's something else. Uh, the prompt parameter is part of the OIDC specification. This is really messy, so OIDC added it, but OAuth implementations, which mostly support OIDC anyway, they also support it, so you can also use it for OAuth flows and so on. And there's four values. None, meaning no user interaction. Uh, login, meaning I want to force, or I want you to force show a login dialog. Even if you know who the user is, let them log in again. Um, we can do consent, as in I, even if the user has given consent before, I want you to pop up the consent dialog again, which can be very useful for consent-based scenarios. And then there's a select account value which is basically what Google uses. So whenever you choose sign in with Google, you don't just silently go back to the application. No, you get this Google page saying like, hey, which one of these 15 Google accounts do you want to log in with? Because if you're anything like me, you actually have like 15 accounts. You have two of your own and then one for the kid's school, for this kid and then one for that kid. And it's like this one, that's a select account. You can force that pop up by setting prompt to select account. Of course, the STS can decide to handle this however they want. They can ignore you, they can do something else. But in general, that's the idea of the prompt parameter. Useful for background scenarios, running a silent flow during bootstrap, um, used very much in front-end uh, applications, by the way, running a silent flow to re renew access tokens or refresh tokens, that's all possible, all right? Silent flows rely on that user's browser's active session, rely on that cookie being present, otherwise the flow will fail. And in many scenarios, we'll deal, we have to deal with things like third-party cookie blocking and so on, but that would take us way too far for this session here today. All right. So far, we talked about backend web applications. If you read the original OAuth spec, 
the one from 2012, you'll see that there's also other types of clients like front-end web applications or maybe even a mobile app. And then you'll see that in 2012, by the way, mobile apps were not really a big thing. It was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then mobile apps became this big thing. And we had some struggles with mobile apps and um, we actually have a dedicated spec um, identifying best practices for mobile apps, which is where Pixie came from. It was a measure introduced from mobile apps. The current best practice today for mobile applications is running an authorization code flow. Here's how that works. So our client is now a mobile app, hence the beautiful icon of a mobile device there. And the user is, um, that error is not supposed to be there. Um, in any way, the, the client app, when it runs a flow, runs an authorization code flow with Pixie. You can check all of these slides, by the way, <laughs> three times before the presentation, there's always going to be an arrow in the wrong place. Um, that's just life when you talk about OAuth. The client in a mobile scenario is going to run a Pixie-based authorization code flow. So what, it, what does it do? It calculates that code verifier, calculates that code challenge, and it starts a flow with the STS. And starting a flow basically means launching an embedded system browser. So the app is going to launch an embedded system browser, not a web view, but an SF Safari view controller or Chrome custom tabs, like the actual system browser embedded in the application. It integrates nicely, and doesn't really pop up a full new browser. It's in the application, but it's a browser-based environment. And that browser-based environment is going to follow a URL, URL, taking it to the security token service. And that security token service is going to handle user authentication. Who are you? Guess what? I'm Philip, and my password is still FluffyDog17! And when that's done, the mobile application, uh, sorry, the security token service is going to store the authorization code with the code challenge, just like before. It's the same flow, and it's going to send the code back to the application. And that's a redirect in the browser, which will then open the application back up and deliver the code to the application. That happens in step number nine at the bottom. And the application can extract the code, and exchange it for tokens. It provides the code verifier there, but no client authentication. You can't, a mobile application doesn't have a client secret, because guess what, if you embed a client secret in an Android app, it takes like three seconds for someone to get it out, and off you go. So there's no client secret, it's just a public client, we call it, a client without authentication. And the SDS will be like, who are you? Oh, what's your code? What's your code challenge? Have code verifier, match it to the code challenge, like before in step 11 and then return the necessary tokens in step 12, allowing the client to handle whatever it wants to handle. That's the current best practice for mobile applications. Sounds mightily complicated, but it really isn't in practice. It's the same steps as before. There's libraries handling this for you, so you don't really have to implement any of this yourself. By the way, we have no client authentication in step 10, that's why Pixie was introduced, because somebody figured out on mobile it's a bit easier to intercept step 9, and since there's no client credentials in step 10, anybody with the authorization code can exchange it. And that's why they added Pixie, so it becomes impossible for a malicious app on your device when it steals a code to exchange it because it doesn't have the code verifier, because that one is stored in the legitimate app, not accessible to the malicious app, just as background information. This is awesome. From a single sign-on perspective, this is great because the mobile app is using a system browser. Guess what that system, that embedded system browser has? Cookies. If you're logged in to your main Chrome browser on Android, uh, the embedded system browser will have that session. So you have single sign-on for mobile apps, which is not a bad thing to have. The downside of this, your marketing people will hate you. If you tell them like, yeah, we're gonna run this embedded browser, and they're like, what the hell is wrong with you? That's a bad user experience. You want to stay in the app. And today, there's no real good answer to this. Yes, you'll find custom implementations of getting credentials and forwarding behind the scenes to the STS, and that is not a recommended best practice yet, because there's a whole bunch of security issues to take into account. I'm just giving you the rundown from mobile apps. So today, the best practice is running this with an embedded system browser. However, in the OAuth working group, there is active work going on to provide a more native user experience for mobile apps. And they're looking into using things like app attestation to implement something like a sort of authentication to protect this step. But for now, there's no official recommended way to do this. 
which translates to if you'll find SDS implementations that have their own way of making this happen. And I'm going to leave it in the middle whether that's a good idea or not. It's not a recommended best practice. And if you do it, there are some serious consequences. But keep an eye on ongoing work because maybe in a few months we'll have a more official recommendation of how to handle this in practice. All right. We talked about that. Um, we talked about that. So embedded browser is not a web view because the reason is in a web view, the application at loading the embedded browser can still interact with the web view. They can see what the user is doing. They can monitor credentials. And that's kind of the whole point of not exposing those to client applications. And in a system browser, you can't monitor the behavior inside. You can tell it something like load this, but that's it. You can't monitor user behavior. And that's the recommended best practice. And then the mobile app has refresh tokens for long-term access. That's whole, the whole idea of mobile apps. You don't want to authenticate every time you use the app. That's really not how it works with a browser and username, password, and multi-factor. But the mobile app will get tokens. And one of these tokens is a refresh token, which can be valid for a long time. And the mobile app can store that refresh token in secure storage, like OS-protected secure storage, often protected biometrics, which is why if you open the app again, you're asked for your fingerprint or face ID, which will unlock the store tokens, which will allow the app to access APIs on your behalf. All right. Those refresh tokens are extremely sensitive. Remember before, the buffer example, backend web client, you needed client credentials to exchange a refresh token. But a mobile app doesn't have client credentials. So you need nothing to exchange a refresh token, which means if somebody steals that refresh token, we are in a world of trouble, like literally a lot of trouble. And that's why there's an additional security mechanism called refresh token rotation. And refresh token rotation basically assumes that if somebody steals a refresh token and they use it, that's not really supposed to happen. If a refresh token is used by the app on one end and by an attacker on the other hand, that's a big problem. So in that case, we'll just blow it all up. Well, I should be careful with that statement. Like, we'll just invalidate all tokens. That's more, <laughs> more uh, less panicky. Uh, we'll invalidate all tokens and stop that flow. That's basically what this means. So here's the legitimate use case. The app obtains tokens, AT1, access token one, and RT1, refresh token one. And AT1 expires after, let's say, an hour or 10 minutes or whatever. And the app can use refresh token one to obtain fresh tokens. Run a refresh token flow, no authentication, but the response contains a fresh access token and a fresh refresh token. So now the app has access token two and refresh token two. And when access token two expires or is about to expire, it uses refresh token two to get access token three. And you can see where this is going, right? And I have one more because then the slide is full. And we use token refresh token three to get tokens at four, five, six, until the absolute lifetime of the refresh token chain is reached, let's say after a year, and then we lose access altogether and the user has to re-authenticate. That's essentially what happens here. How does this work for security? Well, because the SDS monitors abuse of refresh tokens. So let's, let's imagine that something like this happens. The app is humming along and doing its refresh token exchange and blah, blah, blah. And then the attacker steals refresh token too. One way or the other, whatever. And the attacker uses refresh token too. And the SDS doesn't authenticate the client. So the SDS is like, ooh, refresh token too. Here's access token three and refresh token three. And the attacker is like, bam. And they can access the API on your behalf, which is bad. And they can use refresh token three to get token set four, five, six, whatever. This is bad. However, the app is unaware that this happened. So the app at some point in time is going to be like, ooh, let's use refresh token two. And that's when the protection kicks in. That's when the STS says like, what? You've done that before. Well, somebody done that before. This is not what you're supposed to be doing. And that's when they, the security kicks in. The STS will invalidate everything that followed from refresh token two and make sure that the attacker loses access because of this abuse scenario. And that's refresh token rotation. All right, mandatory for clients that cannot authenticate, so public clients. And guess what? I can show you how that works in practice. I like these little demos, by the way. This is fun. So let's run this 
I'm going to use a different client that it doesn't matter. Let's run this as a public client. Let's um, ask for a refresh token. In this case, we have to use that scope. Let's use Pixie as well. And this is just an out zero implementation detail. We have to ask a token for an API to get a refresh token. So don't worry about this. All right, this should work. We disauthenticated or unauthenticated before to show you that error message when prompt was none. So let's re-authenticate. Let's exchange the code for tokens, just like we've done before. Notice, uh, by the way, notice here, we're a public client, so there's no client credentials. Just exchanging the code for tokens without credentials, and we obtain our tokens. And we can see that we now have a refresh token. And the refresh token is only meaningful to the STS. It looks like whatever the STS wants, to, wants it to look like. And this token was issued today. That's how we see it is live, because there's a timestamp in there, which I can make up, by the way, but I didn't. So uh, let's run the refresh token flow. How do we exchange it? Well, the grant type is now refresh token. What are we exchanging for tokens? A refresh token. We are this client, and here's our refresh token. And we exchange it, and we obtain fresh tokens, including the refresh token here was V1 MQSTV, and the new refresh token is V1 MGSTV, and that's a different one. And we can do it again and again. So let's take a look at what happens if we do it again and we steal the refresh token. We're now the attacker and in our life it's as easy as clicking this button and we have now stolen the refresh token. So what we can do is we can exchange it for tokens. We're the attacker now, we have stolen this, there's no secret in here. All you need is that refresh token to exchange it for tokens and bam, there we go. And we get a fresh access token and a fresh refresh token. And we can do it again and again and again if you want to. Until, let me, just a second, let me paste this request right here, because we'll need it in the future. This is the new refresh token we got from the flow. Let's paste that in here to use that in the future. Oh, there we go. If we run this, we would get the next refresh token. But first, we're going to run the same request as the client. And if we do this, we get an error message saying like, no, 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 fail to exchange a refresh token. We go here to the logs and we'll see refresh token abuse something, something. So, or not. Just give it a second. No, apparently we'll not see that. That's kind of weird. Um, doesn't matter, we can try the request as the attacker. This is where the demo is gonna blow, I can feel it, no. If we try this now, it says like unknown or invalid refresh token, that's ex expected behavior. That's the new one, but we used RT2 twice, so RT3, which is this one, gets invalidated towards the future. I'm very uncertain why I don't know. Normally you should see an error message here uh, stating exactly that. Maybe the logs are a bit slow, I don't know. Let's try it again. Yes, there we go. Took a while for the message to arrive, but here it says like reused refresh token detected. That's basically the same refresh token being used twice, and that's a security measure of refresh token rotation. All right. Seriously, five more minutes till the break, I promise. In those five minutes, I'm gonna talk about front-end web clients. <laughs> yeah front-end web clients. The story for front-end web apps is the same. It's a public client. It uses the authorization code flow. So the slide is the same. It has the same error, by the way, so uh, some copy-pasting work going on. But the front-end web client uses Pixie, calculates a code verifier, stores it in the browser, calculates the code challenge, and starts a flow. It's a front-end web app, so it runs in the browser, but it basically navigates the page from the front-end away to the SDS to make that flow happen. And the browser will follow that navigation, send a request, we authenticate as a user or we use the session, nothing changes here. The result is an authorization code being sent back to the front end. What does it mean, sent back to the front end? It means the front end reloads, the JavaScript bootstraps, and then reads the URL. Like, oh, there's a code in the URL, yoink. You pull it into JavaScript and you exchange it for tokens. That's essentially step um, number nine relaunching the front end. The front end then reads the code from the URL, 
sends a request to the SDS without client authentication, because it's a front end, you can't put a secret in JavaScript because it's very easy to read it, and the security token service will issue tokens to the front end. All right, and the front end is very happy, and we're very happy, and now we have our front end Angular app, our front end React app, our front end Vue, Svelte, jQuery, if you hate yourself, whatever. Your front end app has now tokens to contact APIs. And if you're a front end web developer, you're like, oh my God, this is so awesome. Tokens, yes, no cookies. I can just send requests to APIs, and I'm very good to go. And the recommended best practices for this would be like, yeah, you can use refresh token, or you have to use refresh token rotation, and you can try to prevent token exfiltration, and so on and so on. Because the problem with frontends is web frontends are crazy because of JavaScript. A browser has this cool feature where you can translate data and make it executable code. All it takes is one mistake in your application, and then some data that looks like HTML, and all of a sudden, bam, JavaScript code executing because you rendered a review from a user. Like, what the hell? That's cross-site scripting. And cross-site scripting is this insanely dangerous attack for web frontends, and it basically means that the attacker can run code inside a legitimate frontend application. That's the code right there. The attacker has succeeded into running code in the user's browser in the application. And that means game over. And there's some recommendations about this, like, yeah, but maybe you can do this, and maybe you can do that. And I've been working on this for a long time. And we actually had the OAuth security uh, workshop um, with all the people from the OAuth working group um, last month, no, two months ago, end of August in, in the UK. And we talked about this extensively, and there's no way you can fix this. That's basically the conclusion. Like, if this happens, you are done. As in, your user is compromised, the attacker will obtain tokens in the name of the user, giving them long-term access on behalf of the user. The attacker can steal an access token and a refresh token, which basically is as bad as it gets when it comes to OAuth. Access token and refresh token. In a web front-end scenario, that refresh token is valid for maybe eight hours. That's very common. Guess what? That's eight hours that the attacker can be like, bam, I can do whatever I want in the name of the user, and nothing can help here, not even refresh token rotation. This is an absolute nightmare all thanks to HTML and JavaScript. By the way, the same holds for mobile apps. If you build like these fake mobile apps, I have to be careful here <laughs> because I'm gonna get beat up by mobile developers, but fake mobile apps where you basically have HTML and JavaScript packaged as a mobile app, but it's basically a browser running a JavaScript-based application, the same story holds. If you have a native app that doesn't do crazy things like translating data into executable code, you're fine. But the moment you have a live data to code feature like JavaScript HTML parsing, you are in trouble because the attacker can take control of the app and can obtain tokens in the name of the user. I have zero time to talk about this in detail. That's not what this session is intended for. However, I can tell you the best practice. If you're building a security sensitive front-end web application, which means anything else than your grandmother's recipe book, anything that handles personal data, anything that handles business data, you're supposed to use the backend for frontend pattern. Because the backend for frontend moves the OAuth handling to a backend component, where you use client authentication and all the best practices, and then just asks your front and proxies requests for your frontend. That's in a nutshell what the backend for frontend does. I know that this is absolutely useless for you, as in like, yeah, what the hell do I do with that? Well, I actually did a long talk on this. There's a, a talk from earlier this year from NDC Security, where I talked about the insecurity of OAuth and frontends. And there I talk about the details of the attack at great length. So uh, if you want to know more about this, I refer you to that YouTube video. It's about an hour of all the details of what's wrong with web frontends and the idea of how to fix it. And if you look for the same conference, there's a, a talk by Dominic Beyer on how to implement such a BFF for .NET and so on, and that's the recommended best practice. And actually, after the security workshop, the OAuth security workshop, I started working with the people. There's a spec on this called the Browser-Based Apps Best Practices for OAuth, and we're reworking that document to reflect these best practices as well, to highlight the potential attack vectors, the dangers, and the solutions that can help mitigate that problem. But for obvious reasons, like it takes me at least an hour to go through, even longer, I'm not gonna do it right here. I'd be happy to talk about this during the break when you get like a drink. You probably need one right now after all this OAuth stuff.
So let's have a 15 minute break until 20 before five, four, no, 20 to four. And after that, we'll continue with um, more OAT stuff. All right, see you back here in 15 minutes. All right, hope you enjoyed that break. I discovered that the camera tracks me, by the way, automatically so I can move whatever I want. It's just gonna go back and forth really fast. So uh, that's gonna be dizzying on the left of the screen, on the right of the screen, but uh, other than that, we're good. All right, I had a bunch of questions during the break. Like I, I really meant it when I said harass me. I don't mind questions. Um, some questions were about stuff that's coming up. So I told people like come back after the break because we're gonna talk about that. But other questions, um, some of them I could answer, some of them I couldn't. Uh, I don't know everything either but I'll do my best to answer anything you have. All right, before the break, we talked about OAuth. In case you haven't noticed, we talked about the authorization code flow in depth. We talked about a user-facing flow. That's essentially what this meant. User-facing, every user-facing application today, barring some really specific use cases, will rely on that authorization code flow with Pixie. Remember that, authorization code flow with Pixie. Internalize that, that's the go-to OAuth flow for user-facing scenarios. But what if you don't have users? Well, I'm kind of guessing you're a very happy developer if there's no users, there's no user interfaces, like awesome, it's a machine-to-machine -machine communication, software calling APIs, like yeah, that's, that's a pretty good gig if you have that. Thank you for the encouragement. Trust me, it is. Um, in that scenario, you can authenticate however the hell you want, basically. Like, you can use API keys, you can use uh, TLS certificates, you can do whatever you want, because machine-to-machine -machine authentication is really awesome to implement. However, if you already have an OAuth architecture, if you already have an API that accepts requests coming from clients dealing with users, like the RestoGrade API, then if you also need to support non-user-specific clients, like machine clients, it becomes a bit messy trying to implement two mechanisms because one is like, yeah, let's check these access tokens and then also maybe for this type of client, check an API key, like you don't really wanna start doing that. That's gonna create too much complexity. And that's where the client credentials flow fits in. The client credentials flow in OAuth has been there since the beginning. It's super simple and is also the only flow that hasn't changed since 2012 because it's that simple, you can't really screw it up. Um, and the client credentials flow supports exactly the scenario we talked about. You have an API handling access tokens, and if you have a client that needs to access that API directly, no users involved, it can get an access token to make that API call. And that's the client credentials flow. And chances are you've run into this whenever you try to implement client access to a third-party API, like integrate something with a remote API, maybe they, well, very often they're just like, yeah, copy this API key and we're good. But sometimes they tell you like, here's a client ID in a secret and we want you to run a client credentials flow to get an access token so you can access the API on, as your client directly, not on behalf of user, directly as a client. Here's how it works. The client is configured as an OAuth client. The client is going to use an OAuth flow, the client credentials flow, to obtain a access token, and that represents the authority of the client to access the API. And examples include scheduled cron jobs, uh, GitHub actions that need to contact APIs, configuration tools, anything that doesn't involve a user. That's essentially it. How does the flow work? The client goes to the SDS and says like, hey, I have this client ID and this client secret, can I get an access token? And the SDS will verify that against their list of clients, like, oh yeah, your ID is registered and your secret is indeed this. You know what? That's good. Here's your access token. And now the client can send a request to the API and the API can verify the access token like it does before. We'll talk about how that happens in a second. But the, the API just verifies the access token just like it would do with user-based access, makes an authorization decision and does what it needs to do. So from the API's perspective, it's a uniform way of granting access makes sense in an OAuth landscape. From the STS perspective, it's just another client, and the client, well, there's an additional step compared to using an API key, but the overhead is minimal. This is machine to machine, straightforward. All right. Like I said, the flow is so simple that it doesn't need any changing. I mean, this is all there is to it. You send a request, you get a response, and you have a token. What does it look like? Just for good measure, uh, and because we have pretty slides here, the client credentials flow, it starts with grant type client credentials. What are we exchanging for an access token? Client credentials. Here's my client ID, here's my client secret. Now can I get an access token, please? And the response is going to be an access token. That's the response here. The response is basically an access token 
that expires in an hour in this case can be shorter in, because it doesn't really matter in this use case to have long-lived tokens. All right? That's what's going on right here. There's no refresh token. Why not? Because to use a refresh token, we would have to use client credentials because we're a confidential client. But if we have to use client credentials, we can just exchange those for access tokens directly. So there's no need for a refresh token. Whenever you need a new access token, just send the request from step one again, and you'll get a new access token. And you want to do it again in five minutes, then you send the request and you get a new access token. You don't even have to store access tokens. Well, it depends a bit, but you don't have to store access tokens because every time you need them, you can ask for them. Of course, some implementations don't really like it if you do that. They don't like it if you run a GitHub action every five minutes that asks for a new access token because it puts a lot of load on a managed service. And that's why they put some restrictions on how many times you can do this based on your plan. So if you want to do this a lot, you have to pay them a lot. So it varies how deep your pockets are, uh, whether you want to implement token caching or not. Um, that's just a small implementation detail here. The client credentials flow fits into OAuth as a whole. It's, it doesn't really solve a problem that we have, but it just makes sense if you're already building APIs that handle OAuth access tokens, then it doesn't make sense to implement a secondary client authentication mechanism with API keys or TLS certs, and it makes much more sense to just integrate something with access tokens as we've been doing all along. And that's what's going on right here. No users involved, no access on behalf of a user, just straight up client to API access, all right? This flow only works with confidential clients. You can't do this with a client that doesn't have a secret because that would make zero sense at all. So that's, that's why this flow requires client credentials. Hence the name client credentials flow or grant. All right, that was the easiest OAuth flow you're ever gonna find. So uh, yay for that. And that covers the flows. There's a few more. The device authorization grant, for example, the device flow is what you use if you want to pair Spotify uh, or authenticate to Spotify on an Apple TV, because guess what? There's no real easy authentication. So they show you a URL like go to Spotify something something, enter this code and they can complete the flow on your cell phone and it authenticates or gives tokens to the app on the Apple TV, stuff like that. We're not going to talk about those. If you want to learn more, I, um, I can point you towards that later. Good. That brings us to the part of OAuth where things get a bit murky. Because OAuth and all the specs, what they mostly focus on is that interaction between the client and the STS. Like the flow with all the steps to get tokens. And then once you have tokens, it's like, meh, you, you deal with that. And there's some pieces and bits that are there. Um, but in general, there's a lot more flexibility and open-endedness on that part of the OAuth landscape. And we're going to talk about two things here. We're going to talk about scopes, how you, and how you can use scopes. And we're going to talk about access tokens, different types, and how an access token is handled by the API. And once we've done that, we have reached the end of the session right here. What's the purpose of a scope? What is a scope? Well, a scope is anything you want it to be. The OAuth spec defines the scope parameter, says like, yeah, you ask for a scope here, that's how the STS grants a scope, but what you do with that, like, yeah, whatever. Scopes are a string value with space delimited entries. So it's like one long string with spaces and every space denotes a new scope. That's essentially what this means. So OAuth provides it, it defines the format, but it doesn't define any values. It just says like, yeah, you can use this however you want. OIDC on the other hand is like, oh, in that case, we're going to use a scope to make an OAuth flow an OIDC flow. By adding that open ID scope, that basically takes an existing OAuth flow and magically transforms it into an OIDC flow. That's an open ID scope. And other than that, you can define your own scopes, custom scopes, and you can do whatever you want with that. That's how scopes work in practice. I know that's not very useful, like do whatever you want. It's like, yeah, okay, and now what do we do with that? Thank you. Depends on what you're building. If you're building Google, which I, I probably doubt you are, but if you're building Google, then you have like a few hundreds or even thousands of scopes. And if you look at this, I don't know if you can read this, but the screen is big enough for sure. But if you look at this, you'll have, um, where's my highlighter? You'll have scopes for Gmail. If you want to build an app that accesses a Gmail API, you can request one of these scopes. And as you can see in Google, um, they have compartmentalized the API features into certain scopes. For example, if you're building a 
depressing productivity app that shows you at the end of the day how many unread emails you have in your inbox. I mean, that's a good way to kick somebody when they're down at the end of the day. You don't really need the ability to send emails in the name of the user, right? All you need to be able to do is read their inbox. So there's a scope for that, gmail.read only. And that allows you to request the minimal amount of scopes needed to perform the operation as a client application against Google, against the Gmail API. And that's an interesting take. And Google uses very long scopes because they want to use the scope to differentiate between different APIs. I mean, read-only on Gmail means something entirely different than read-only on the calendar API, right? So you can't just use read-only and then hope that you can figure out where it belongs. That's why they add uh, gmail.read-only and they use a full URL in this case. And you also have the full scope, like uh, mail.google.com gives you full access to Gmail. Um, and based on what scopes you're requesting, Google can and maybe have some certain policies like, hey, if you want to build a client that accesses full access to Gmail, you have to subject yourself to a third-party security review and so on and so on. But that's just policy. That's no implementation of that. All right. Now, for everybody not building Google, your scopes probably don't look as clean as the Google scopes. In reality, you'll discover a lot of tech depth in scopes and a lot of weird changes in behavior, and GitHub is a very good example of that. You can see how GitHub scopes grew naturally because they have some, um, some subdivided scopes like repo invite and admin scopes, but also some, some weird things like public repo and just the repo scope altogether. And you can see that they started subdividing scopes after a while in read-write, but sometimes they don't, and so on and so on. That's normal. I mean... Scopes are a mess. That's, that's basically a given if you're dealing with scopes. I wish I could tell you the one and only way to define scopes. But there is no one and only way to define scopes. It's all about what you want to achieve with a scope. Scopes are very often linked to consent. That's kind of the rough idea of a scope. Like the, the user... Let, let me try to explain what the idea is behind OAuth and behind scopes. Let's use Google as an example. I, as a user, in OAuth terminology, am the owner of my Google account. Google definitely disagrees with that, but in OAuth terminology, I'm the owner of my data, the resource owner, right? I have full access to my Google account. I can do whatever I want on my calendar. I can do whatever I want in my Gmail inbox. I can basically do, I'm, I'm the owner. I can do what I want. If a client wants access, like Zoom wants to access my Google calendar, I do not want to give Zoom full access to my Google account. That would make zero sense to do that. And scopes are a way for me to grant certain authority to Zoom. So Zoom will have to ask for a scope. In this example, Zoom will ask, it's not on the Google slide I had, but Zoom will ask like, hey, I would like read and write access to the calendar API. And Google will authenticate me and then pop up a dialogue like, hey, Philippe, are you sure you want to give Zoom this access to your calendar? Because it's, it's important to have that consent because otherwise Zoom can do whatever I want, whatever it wants on my calendar API without my consent. So I have to say like, yes, I explicitly want that to happen or no, I do not. And that's the consent uh, related to scopes. And then when everything is approved, Zoom gets a token and in that token, there will be a scope parameter saying like, hey, calendar read, calendar write or whatever the actual scope is. And that's how I can delegate partial authority for my full access. I can give like a very small subset to a very specific client because they asked for it and decide that that's a good idea. That's the concept of scopes. And then after a while, as always, if you give people the option, do what you want with that. People do crazy things with scopes. And you'll find applications where you have like hundreds of scopes and clients have to ask for like a whole gazillion configuration of scopes and you run into like token length limits in headers and it's like bad idea. In general, you're supposed to try and keep scopes as, as fine-grained as needed without going haywire on that. If you have a document, like a 12-page document describing your scopes, you're probably not using scopes the way they are intended to be used. And you might want to look into other ways of handling authorization. Some rules of thumb, some guidelines of what you can do with scopes. Let's say we're building a restaurant review application. We have two types of resources. We have restaurants and we have reviews, right? How would you define scopes in that? Well, you can see an example right here. Um, what's the reasoning here? We'll divide scopes into two silos, reviews and restaurants, two different types of resources that will have different levels of access. All right. 
And after each of these, we'll think about, do we need more fine-grained scopes? For restaurants, well, reading a restaurant, there's no specific permission for that. Everybody can do that. That's kind of public info. But managing a restaurant, there's only one client that will need that scope, the restaurant manager application. Nobody will ever request that because we don't really allow anybody else to get that level of access to restaurants. So there, it wouldn't make much sense. So we just kept the restaurant scope as it is. For reviews, well, we have that third-party access scenario, right? We have that virtual foodie app that will request read access to the user's reviews so they can pull statistics and give you recommendations. So we want to split out read and write access. Why? So we can tell the user in the consent form, hey user, this application will only have read access to your reviews. They won't be able to write stuff or post stuff on your behalf, just read stuff. And that's why we add a custom scope for reviews. Of course, if you have read, then it makes sense to have write as well. We also have delete as a separate scope. Why? Because users like to be reassured. If you tell a user like, yeah, they might be able to read and write data, but they can never delete data from your account, that's a reassurance. By having that as a separate scope, you can tell them, unless the application actually gets that scope, the user or the application will never be able to delete stuff. Just as one example of a rule of thumb of how to handle scopes in practice. Um, of course, your mileage may vary. You can come up with all kinds of different patterns that work for your applications because usually you're not building a restaurant review application either. The concept of scopes as they are envisioned in the OAuth landscape is to allow a user to delegate a subset of their full authority to a client application. And then closely related to that, give consent for that. And that consent really matters. Because I, as a user, have decided against granting certain permissions to an application because they were asking for way too much access. I have a, a scanner that can scan directly into Evernote. And the scanner is from Brother, and the hardware is absolutely awesome, and the software is the worst scanning software you've ever seen. Seriously, I, have to buy, I had to buy a second application to scan with my Brother scanner to make it work. And when I wanted to try out the Evernote feature, Brother was asking, it was using OAuth for this with the Evernote APIs and was asking like, hey, I would like to have full access to your Evernote account. Like all your notebooks, read, write, delete, whatever. And I was like, yeah, if you can't get your scanning software to work, I'm not gonna give you that amount of access to something that contains potentially sensitive information. And the consent step there, I decided against that and did not grant that access. So that consent really works. Same for Zoom and Google. If you wanna click the Zoom button, connect your Google Calendar and all of a sudden you see like, hey, Zoom can read your entire calendar and create appointments, you can be like, why does it want to read my entire calendar? Like, no, I don't want that to happen. Deny. That's how consent plays a role here. All right. Sure, let's, let's do another demo. Um, things haven't blown up yet, so uh, let's see if we can keep the track record going. This one is still running. I'm going to disconnect it and we're going to reconnect it again. When we reconnect it, the reason I want to do that is um, because it will pop up a consent dialog. And the consent dialog here says, in case the screen isn't big enough, I can make this bigger. The consent dialog says, hey, Virtual Foodie is asking access to your Restorate account and it wants to read your reviews and it wants offline access. Now, what does that mean? Read reviews means the scope requested here was to read reviews, obviously, and the offline access is our zero's way of saying, we're gonna give the application a refresh token. So it can keep accessing your account even if you're not online anymore, because it will have a refresh token. Why is this being asked? Because if you would inspect this application's code, that's this application right here, the OAuth configuration, is here at the bottom or at the middle, at the top, whatever. The OAuth configuration here is configured to ask for read colon reviews as a scope along with offline access. That's how this ties in. The client is asking for it. The STS in this case is deciding that they want to prompt the user for that. And then once you get that, um, if you get that token, it will be present inside the token as a claim and the API can rely on that as we will talk about later. This consent is optional. 
It's relevant in third-party scenarios, like Zoom accessing Google. Google wants to make damn sure you are on board with that, because otherwise they're in big trouble if you deny, or if you're not on board and they did it anyway. In a enterprise setting, in a business setting, consent is often very implicit. If you're an employee, your company's application is not going to ask you if you want to allow your company application access to your company data on the company API. They're going to be like, yeah, yeah, whatever, that's implicit. Um, of course, you agree to that. That's your employee agreement. We can handle your data any way we want. That's called a first-party scenario. And in first-party scenarios, consent is often implicitly handled. In third-party scenarios, it's often very explicitly uh, dealt with with consent dialogues. And again, it's not defined, so you can do anything you want with that. All right, that's where scopes come from. Scopes, from that point on, start to live a bit on their own, as in people run into limitations of scopes. Like, reading reviews is fine, but what if you only want to allow a client to read certain reviews? Like, how could you handle that? Which, for reviews, doesn't make much sense, but imagine you're building an e-health application and you want to allow the client access to certain patient records, but not all of them. Read patient records? Meh, probably not a good idea. But read patient records for this specific patient? Like, yeah, we can, we can deal with that as a scope. And then all of a sudden you have dynamic scope values. Scope values that aren't predefined as static strings, but includes dynamic identifiers. And it kind of works on a small scale. You can make this work in very close, close scenarios where you control all of the parts. You can have this kind of scope mechanism built in. But they require a very close coupling between your STS and your authorization logic. You can't do this on third-party scenario. It's, it's going to be a mess if you try to do that. And things evolved from there because um, we started using OAuth for all kinds of features. Open banking is built on OAuth. But scopes in open banking, like a client asking permission to perform wire transfers from your account, like wire transfers as a scope, probably don't want to say like, oh yeah, sure, you can have permission to wire money wherever you want. That's not something you want to do. In that case, you want to give permission to send 50 euros from this account to that account for a specific transaction. That would be a dynamic scope. But there's no way to express that with a string of space-delimited values. And that's where RAR comes in. And RAR is called Rich Authorization Requests, and it's basically a highly detailed format for a client to ask consent for specific transactions with all the details included, like I want to send this amount of money for that uh, to that specific account in an online purchase scenario, something like that, and that's how that plays a role. Again, I, I can't go into detail. RAR is a very new addition and is highly relevant for these advanced use cases in e-health scenarios, in uh, financial scenarios, and so on. If you're in that kind of use case, um, maybe useful to check out in practice. All right. Let's talk about access tokens. I'm going to answer the question that somebody asked me during the break, like, how does API handle an access token? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the other part of the triangle. So like I said before, much of the complexity is right here. Let's talk about this part. That's the part that's a bit less defined in the OAuth specs. There's some definitions, uh, but all in all, it's implementation logic that you handle at the API side. And to do that, we have to look at how the client accesses APIs. They access an API by sending an access token. We kind of established that already. The client sends a request like get reviews, and you typically include an authorization header with a token type bearer, and you send the access token right there. And the API gets it out of the header, and then what happens? Well, it depends on the type of token. Because OAuth has two types of tokens. You have a reference token and you have a self-contained token. And a reference token is an identifier. It means nothing. And a self-contained token is a token that contains all of the information that the API will need to make a decision. And guess who decides what type of token that is being used? The security token service. Your STS is configured to give a client an access token and it can decide on a whim, usually it's configured, but whatever, you can have like a random number and decide like, oh, it's less than five, so let's give you a reference token and otherwise you get a self-contained token. 
In, in reality, you pr probably don't do that. In reality, you configure a client like you get reference tokens, you get self-contained tokens, or you don't configure it at all because your STS only supports one or the other. But clients should not be dependent on the type of token. They can use or inspect the token for like diagnostics or debugging purposes, but you should not write client code that tries to open up a token, inspect some claims, because the client should not rely on that or is explicitly forbidden by the spec to rely on that. In reality, it's not always true, but in practice, you should take that to heart. All right. Note that um, identity tokens are handled by the client. Those formats are well-defined and clients are supposed to process them but access tokens are not supposed to be processed by the client. What does that mean for the API? The API is expected to make authorization decisions, so the API has to handle an access token. So how do you handle a self-contained access token? And how do you handle a reference access token? <coughs> Let's talk about that. Let's start with reference tokens. Here's an example of a reference token. Obvious, right? If you receive this as an API, it's like, oh yeah, of course. That's, you have no idea what this means. A reference token is an identifier, a reference to state kept by the security token service. That's all it is. And it basically means that the access token is just a placeholder and that the API has to go back to the STS and be like, hey, I got this token from the client, what does that mean? And the STS will look it up in its database like, oh yeah, this ID or this reference, I stored this state with that and it returns a bunch of claims to the API saying like, oh yeah, this token means this, 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 and this. And the API is like, ah, excellent. That means something to me, and now I can make my authorization decision. And this process is called token introspection. And it's as heavy as it looks. Yes, it's every request in step one triggers a request in step two and a response in step three before you can make an authorization decision. That's called token introspection. Here's a token introspection response, what you see in step three. And the most important claim in this response is on line two, active. It's a Boolean. Guess what it means. <laughs> You're smart people, you can figure this one out. Um, this Boolean is either true or false. If it's false, the token is not active and you're supposed to abort immediately. There will not be any other claims in the response, by the way, except active false. If active is true, that token is valid and you get all the claims that are stored at the SDS associated with this token. And those claims allow the API to make authorization decisions. More on that later. All right. The SDS controls token introspection. There's a spec that defines how to handle token introspection, but the SDS can decide to give uh, certain clients more information than other clients. For example, first party clients, like internal clients, they get much more information about an access token, and maybe a third-party client gets a few limited uh, claims only. That's perfectly possible, not necessary, but perfectly possible. All right, what's the benefit of using reference tokens? Why would you subject yourself to that pattern of sending a request to translate a token into claims? Control. Control over tokens, revocation properties of tokens. If you're building, let's imagine you're building a banking app with access tokens. And your access token is valid for 10 minutes. That's a short window of time, that's good. But if somebody steals an access token and allows them to make wire transfers on a bank account, 10 minutes of abuse is still kind of problematic. Well, I'm not sure what kind of bank you're running, but in most banks, this would be problematic. So what you might want to do there is, in case a token is compromised, you have to revoke it immediately and with reference tokens, you can do that. With reference tokens, you can actually, you keep them at the STS. All it takes is dropping a line from the database. Well, probably you want something more sophisticated with an audit trail and so on, but in my simplistic view, it means delete from tokens where access token equals this. Bam. The token is no longer valid, and the next time a request comes in to wire 2 million to Nigeria, the STS is going to be like, I don't know what the token means, invalid. Active, false, and off you go. That's the benefit of reference tokens. The benefit comes at a cost, right? Most of you are like, yeah, let's not do that. So what's the alternative? The alternative are self-contained tokens. They're bigger. That's their downside, they're bigger. A self-contained token contains all the information right there, 
and it's encoded in most cases as a JSON web token. A JSON web token which is signed by the STS with a private key. So the STS has signed that token and in that token are claims and those claims are the same as you would get from token introspection. So how does the API handle that? Well, the token comes into the API. The API is like, ooh, it's a self-contained token. It verifies the signature. Like, is this actually valid? Has somebody modified claims in the token? Has somebody changed the admin claim to true when it was false before? Signature verification will alert you to those changes. Signature verification will be like, Haha, this token is no longer valid, and you get drop it altogether. But if the signature checks out, if the signature is valid, then the token is in the exact format as it was generated by the STS when they gave it to the client. That's good. Next, you check some additional claims in the token, like a timestamp. Is this token expired? Because if the timestamp of EXP expiration is in the past, you want to reject it as well, and so on. Makes sense, right? And from that point on, you get the claims, and with those claims, you can make authorization decisions, as we talk about later. How does this work in practice? Well, the API is configured with a trusted STS. You tell your API, your API doesn't just accept tokens from all over the world, no. You tell your API, like, hey, when we're going to accept tokens, why don't we accept tokens from sts.restacrate.com? And when you do that, the API is like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Well, it's less verbose, it's not Java, so it's not that verbose, but and the, SCS is basically, the API is basically going to be like, okay, in that case, I'm going to load the signing key or the signature verification key from the STS, so whenever I get a token, I can verify whether this is valid. All right? All of that stuff is implemented in middleware. Fetching keys and all of that stuff is not something you have to implement yourself, usually, and you can do that in resource server libraries. Resource server, that's the OAuth concept of an API, uh, of what we've been talking about. It's a resource server, and there's libraries for all modern languages to handle these JSON web token-based access tokens. They will handle signature verification and will alert you when there's a problem or give you the claims when there is no problem. All right. If you really want to, you can do token introspection for self-contained access tokens as well if you want to. As in the token introspection spec says like, yeah, you know what, if you really want to, nothing prevents you from running a token introspection step for self-contained access tokens. In case you want to make sure it's really valid, even though it's, supposed to, it's still supposed to be valid, you can do token introspection. All right, let me show you a couple of lines of code just to see what's going on. To show you that, let's go to the RestoGrade API, which has hard-coded data, as all good APIs do. Um, anyway, what we do here is we're using in library, like I said, middleware, to verify access tokens. In this case, it's express oa2.bearer, as in it's a library explicitly intended to process JSON web token-based access tokens. And here's the relevant lines of code. We configure our application to use it, and we tell it the issuer base URL is sts.restorgate.com. And that's it. And this behind the scenes will make a call to that authorization server, to that STS, fetch relevant metadata from a specific, specific uh, dot well known endpoint, load that JSON config file, figure out where the signing keys are, retrieve those signing keys dynamically, load them into memory, and next time you receive a request with a token, it will verify the signature on that token and expose the claims to the API. And the claims are exposed in rec.art.payload. That's basically where you find the claims of that JSON web token, allowing you to make authorization decisions in your API, as we'll talk about in a second or a few minutes. All right, which token type is right for you? Depends on your perspective. Is your, if you're a performance engineer, you're like, yes, yeah, self-contained tokens. If you're a developer, eh, self-contained tokens. If you're a security specialist, you're going to be like, ooh, reference tokens look pretty awesome because they have great security properties. Your developers will probably dislike you very much, but that's the trade-off you have to make, security versus performance. In reality, it's not that complicated. In reality, this is often a paper comparison. 
Like, yes, in theory, reference tokens have great revocability, but it only matters if you have an automatic revocation process. If your revocation process is manual, like a user detecting abuse on their banking app and they have to call the help desk, and at the help desk, they're gonna tell like, yeah, I want you to revoke my access token. The help desk person is gonna be like, what? I have no idea what you're talking about. Trust me, I've been there. I called my bank to tell them to revoke tokens and they were like, what? Um, until I got to speak to a developer who actually knew what this was about. So if that process is manual and it takes longer than the lifetime of an access token, you don't need this because you can always revoke refresh tokens. And poof, the problem goes away anyway. But if you have an automatic revocation process, anomaly detection, abuse detection, something automated that says like, this is weird, bam, revoke access token, then this might matter in practice. Just a couple of guidelines right here. So the performance impact is there. Token introspection is often not supported in SaaS applications. So if you have a, an out zero that's running as a SaaS somewhere, God knows where, they don't support reference tokens, as in, they don't want to deal with you token introspecting the whole time. They don't want to offer support for that. So they're like, yeah, yeah, we don't care. You get self-contained tokens or you can go home. That's basically what the, the policy is there. Um, also means reference tokens are often used internally. If you can do token introspection within your own network, within your own application, it's a lot faster to deal with that and a lot more capable. All right. Reference tokens are easy to revoke before they expire. Only relevant, I would say, if you have an automated process. Otherwise, if it's manual, it doesn't matter. Then focus on revoking refresh tokens. And um, they both have limited lifetimes, which means that if you can keep your lifetime short enough, if your access tokens are limited to five minutes or 10 minutes of lifetime, after which you have to use a refresh token, then maybe that window is acceptable for your use case. If you're building an online shopping application, I can imagine that five minutes of abuse is not great, but also not the end of the world. If you're building a bank, meh, different story. And that's why I can't give you one recommendation. It all depends on what is acceptable to you and what you can implement in practice. All right. And that brings us to the final step, which I conveniently put in one slide, just for easy access. How do you make authorization decisions with access tokens? And that brings us out of the realm of OAuth and into the realm of API security, which also puts it a bit out of scope for this session, because it very much depends on how you want to make your authorization decisions. Some guidelines. Step one, the client sends you an access token. That's the premise we have here. Whether that's a access token from an authorization code flow or an access token from a client credentials flow, it doesn't matter. It's an access token issued by the SDS. What do you do? Well, it depends on the type of token. Sometimes you have to implement support for both types. Sometimes you can be assured that it's a self-contained token or a reference token, but it depends a bit because self-contained tokens, you verify the signature, the issuer claim, the EXP and MBF claims. These are important. And with introspection, you introspect the token and then you check the active claim. But at the end of this step, your API logic, your authorization logic has a set of claims. Doesn't matter where they came from, they have a set of claims that have some specific claims you can rely on and maybe some custom claims as well. The next step is making some API specific claims. Depends on what you're using. If you're using Auth0, for example, every token contains an audience claim. Who is this token intended for? And that contains an identifier of the API. So we check like, is this identifier me? Because if the identifier says calendar.google.com and your gmail.google.com, you can Throw it away like that. That's not my token. Go away. There's also an OAuth spec called resource indicators, which allows you to compartmentalize access per API. In a flow, it's, it's a bit more complicated, but that's what it does. And it also uses this audience claim. It's a job reserved claim, has a specific meaning. If it's present, if you rely on that, you have to check it. Then we check more generic claims. As in generic, scopes. Not object level access control, but we call that often function level access control. Like, hey, we're trying to delete a review. Does the client have the authority to delete reviews? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. A scope would be a good indicator in the token if the application uses scopes. If the delete reviews scope is there, then you can grant access to this functionality. Otherwise, you want to skip it. That's essentially what this means. And then the fourth step, 
It's very easy for me to put on a slide, but that's where everything gets screwed up, usually when authorization comes into play. Make specific authorization decisions. Object level authorization, or even object property level authorization. If you look at the API security top 10, these problems are known as BOLA or BOPLA, because I don't know why. BOLA means broken object level authorization, and then recently they added BOPLA, broken object property level authorization, because you can have authorization up down to specific fields of objects that needs to be enforced. How do you do that? Well, it depends on what you're building. I can't give you a specific answer to that. It all depends on what you're building. You might want to check the SUB claim containing the identifier of the user. If I want to delete a review, maybe it's a good check to check if I'm the owner of that review. Check my SUB against the user or the owner or the author of that review and make sure it matches. You can check uh, customer IDs or tenant IDs. If you have a multi-tenant application, you can include a custom claim in your token that says like customer ID is seven. And if you want to delete something from customer nine, the response should be like, go away, bad user. And report that as a security vulnerability or security uh, event. You can also have things like client IDs. If you have client credentials, access tokens, there might be a client ID in there. You can be like, yeah, this client is not really supposed to access these features. I'm going to deny access or allow access or whatever. And this can go as far as you want. You can include roles in your tokens. You can include specific permissions. You can push this as far as you want um, to uh, relate it to your specific application. All right. Let me show you a quick example. Well, I've already shown you, but I didn't mention it. Here's the Restograde API, and here's how we enforce the use of scopes in the request. Again, middleware. That resource server middleware that I use to verify the signature on the token has a feature to check if the token contains the right scopes, because that's how you often implement authorization. And to access the user's reviews, you need the read reviews scope before that is allowed. That is one use case of implementing that. And then in this case, we're fetching reviews for a specific user, and that means that we're going to filter the actual, and we're going to find the user based on that SUB claim in the token. We're going to use that to retrieve the actual internal user, and then we're going to use uh, that user to fetch reviews for this particular user. That would be object level authorization implemented right here. Like I said, heavy lifting is definitely done by that library which you will find for other languages as well. So Spring has one, uh, .NET has one. You'll find this for uh, most languages because it just consolidates a couple of features into a nice usable interface. All right. That 180 minute timer is down to seven, so uh, time to wrap up. Time flies, by the way, when you're teaching, which is uh, awesome. I hope it flew by for you as well. Um, you're probably exhausted, which I can fully get. Um, trust me, I've, I've been doing this for a while. I know how intense it gets. The thing is, the session is called Introduction to OAuth and OIDC, because this is just the beginning. This is just understanding what these things do, what they can do, um, where some of the pitfalls lie, how you secure your flows against best practices, but there's so much more. As in, I can literally talk for three days straight about these topics, uh, going into excruciating detail on how these things work and what kind of uh, security requirements are coming to play, how you want to handle that. Where can you focus if you want to learn more? Look up this talk. If you're dealing with web frontends, like some people said, like, yeah, I've been playing around with React applications, watch this talk, seriously. Um, it's not good. <laughs> Let me summarize it as one word, it's not good. Uh, there's a slide in there, so are we screwed uh, as a question? And the answer is yes. And then the, the last five minutes focus on the idea of the solution, and then you can find plenty of other resources actually diving into the solution. That's one thing. The second thing is there's a whole bunch of additional OAuth specs. Like I said, OAuth is being used in highly security sensitive environments these days e health, banking. And some of the properties of OAuth are not that great for banking applications. Like having that authorization request with all these parameters. Malicious users can be like, yeah, I'm going to change this one into that and maybe modify it. You don't want that. As a client, you don't want the user messing around with your parameters. So that's not good. And that's why we have things like um, pushed authorization requests, where you can send your data to the, the STS in a back channel and then just use an ID in a front channel. Or 
uh, its par that spec or JAR, JS uh, JSON Web Token Secured Authorization Requests. Not to be mistaken with Java JARs, it's a OA JAR. And that JAR basically, instead of having all these parameters, puts them in a signed JOT to send through the front channel. And there's a whole bunch of these additional specs that take OAuth to kind of the next level, to high secure OAuth, which will never be part of OAuth 2.1, by the way, because there are new features and OAuth 2.1 is just a consolidation of best practices. So it will always be an N and N story. Resource indicators is about compartmentalizing APIs, highly relevant, um, is, has been an RFC for a while now and is starting to see adoption in uh, many implementations. So look into that one. Um, we have uh, pushed authorization requests, PAR. We have um, JSON rich authorization requests, RAR. Seriously, abbreviations uh, all the way. We have uh, the JAR spec, which is about JSON web token secured authorization requests. We have a FAPI profile, which used to be financial API uh, security profile, like specific configuration requirements for financial APIs. And then eHealth started using that, so the financial API abbreviation didn't really make sense. So we still have FAPI, but it doesn't mean financial anymore. It's just fortified APIs is the best we came up with. I have to describe FAPI as an abbreviation, but that's essentially um, just a few pointers of how far this can take you. All right. If you're like, holy crap, that's a lot. I have no idea how I'll ever figure that out. And if you kind of like the presentation here, I'm also running an OAuth course. I did one a few years ago, and I'm running a new live online, uh, online course. So I'm going to be teaching online for four weeks. Um, not full time, trust me. <laughs> uh, but two, three hour sessions a week for four weeks. So that's uh, a lot of hours on OAuth. We're all going to be diving into all of the details of stuff I skipped here. I have plenty of examples in the same style as this one. So if you like this one, check out the online course that's coming up. It starts mid-November, so you still have some time to figure out if you want to join that or not. All right. Let me wrap it up in three minutes, which kind of works out because my conclusion slide has three takeaways, which is just a subset of what we talked about, but the three most important takeaways. Number one, OAuth is about allowing a client to access APIs. Most often on behalf of a user. Most often there's gonna be a user involved somehow to make that happen, but we also have that client credentials grant where there's no user involved, so it's between brackets. But that's what OAuth does. Remember that. By the way, the client credentials flow only exists for OAuth, not for OIDC. That's a very good tell if somebody comes to you like, yeah, we're running OpenID Connect with the client credential flow. That's a good way for me to tell if I'm talking to a new customer, like, yeah, you need some help because these things don't match, ma mix and match because OIDC is all about user authentication. OIDC has nothing to do with API access, nothing with OAuth, nothing with access tokens or most almost nothing. It's all about user authentication and client credentials. There's no users, so there's no user authentication. And then finally, User-facing applications, the best practice for that, those kind of applications, unless you're doing something really specific, is the authorization code flow with Pixie. And I know this condenses three hours into three takeaways, which is not great, but I guess doing a 15-minute recap of <laughs> the last uh, three hours is also not very much recommended. Uh, you can review the slides. There's a whole, load, uh, whole bunch of text on the slides for you to review later on. You can grab them from my website, from LinkedIn, um, so they're not that hard to find. So do that, I recommend that to you. And with that, I wanna thank you for being here. Um, connect with me on LinkedIn uh, or Mastodon if you want to. Um, you can connect with me on Twitter, I'm still there, but I don't open that in reality, so uh, good luck with that. But um, LinkedIn and Mastodon are definitely active, um, or I'll follow up on that, and make, see if you wanna join that course in November. And otherwise, thank you for being here. If you have any questions, I'm not gonna run away just yet, so you can come up to me after the talk and we can flesh it out right then and there. And otherwise, uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. I'll be back on Wednesday to talk about API security for a bit. Um, shorter session, 50 minutes, but still relevant. All right, thank you.